Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Chatting with Nuts. This is episode 22, and I am your host, Jimmy Nuts, of course. And today I am I am joined by one of the most thoughtful uh, booktubers that I know and someone that's constantly doing research and Instagram polls and figuring out what makes us tick as readers, I feel. Uh, and that is Bookborn. Bookborn, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks for having me on, Jimmy. I don't know if I'm the most... I don't know if I'm those things you said, but I'll take it. I like it. Oh, absolutely. I, one of the things <laughs> I find fascinating about you is, so I don't like Instagram at all. Um, if anyone, actually, you just followed me the other day. You're like, I thought I was following you. I don't but you post. had no post. I think that's I don't why I got post. confused. <laughs> I, I have 700 followers on Instagram. I have never posted on Instagram. Um, Legend. But, yeah, I, I, you know, people just... <laughs> They're, they're drawn to me, I guess. But uh, but uh, the one thing I do like about Instagram is you run a ton of polls. I do. What's, and what? I use them in my videos. Yeah, and you do. So uh, and I don't mean to like blitz you with questions off the back, no. but I find that fascinating because I'm a big fan of polls. Actually, the first thing I did when I got my community tab on YouTube was start polling people. Do a poll? Yeah. What's your, going to be your favorite weapon if you were in a book? Everything. Are you character driven? I should start with? using my community tab to poll people. I don't know why I use Instagram and not my community tab. Why haven't well, I not been doing that? The, I hear the community tab is great for the algorithm. I don't know what that means really, but that's what I hear. Oh, hello, mother. Hi, mom. I'm I'm your mom. No, my mom is in the chat. Oh, your mom's in the <laughs> chat. I was like, what? I don't understand this joke. Someone you can you can be the bookish mom if you want. <laughs> like that's, that's I'm like, what? I don't understand. Oh, okay. Hi, Jimmy's mom. Oh, I don't man. tell my mom about these. My mom is my biggest fan. She uh, she was my biggest fan in wrestling, and she watches every single stream I do here on the channel. She she has sat through nine Malazan streams. <laughs> I mean, my mom, I just told my mom about my channel because I was too embarrassed to tell anybody in my real life about my channel until like a month ago. Yeah, I am wearing my Hey Nerd shirt. You can come at me. Um, <laughs> and um, I just told her about it and she went through and watched every single one of my videos. My mom has never read a fantasy book in her life. She has no idea what I'm talking about. So like, I get the energy. I appreciate it. <laughs> I think she's just excited that every every now and then I'll drop an antidote from my childhood or use an example. And she's like, I know that. <laughs> I've she, been there. I was yeah, there. Yeah, she loves that. Um, but you, you, what I was saying, you you run a ton of polls. So yeah. d was that an idea that you had or did you just start doing polls? Like, Because you do use them in your videos, which I actually like quite a bit. I I just have a lot of questions in my head and I just need to know the answers to them. That's that's all it is. I just um with the most recent one I did was about Wheel of Time um, because ugh, we're already talking about Wheel of Time. I really didn't want to, but here we are. It was just that it's just the poll I, I did was about was about like, who do you think the main character is in Wheel of Time? Trying to just be like, hmm. would like because a lot of people were upset that Rand wasn't a bigger feature. But I thought, well, maybe people don't think Rand's the main character. So I just I wanted to know. Um, and so I've gotten a lot of interesting answers. The only thing I don't like about Instagram polling is that people can't follow directions. Um, I will be like, don't answer this poll if you haven't read the book. And then people, I am a hundred percent positive who have not read the book. I've done it. Answer the polls. And I'm like, I, I said, don't answer the poll. I think you have to have the see results <laughs> button if it's, if it's an option. I don't know if it's an option, but you know, I want to see the results. Yes. And that is annoying, but I always post the results. So like I tell people, like I will post the results, follow directions. And I do have people who like message me and be like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't follow directions. And I'm like, well, don't, this makes me even matter. Like <laughs> follow the directions. I can't handle it. So as someone that develops applications that uh, users use every day, and I expect them to do one thing with the app and they do another, <laughs> I feel your pain. I really do. <laughs> I, just, I just, anyway. So that's, that's the problem with polling is I usually have a specific, you know, I'm, I love stats. I love statistics. And with statistics, you have to have a very certain amount of rules met for the statistics to mean something. And so every time I post an Instagram poll, it's like they're never meeting the standards that I would like to be met. For so it your just research. Makes it like a, for my research. This is technical <laughs> research for my small booktube channel and it matters. Um, so that's the only thing I don't like about polling is it never is like, you can't really control it. Needed to be. I can't control it. That's the problem. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. But it, I still do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and I love it. Uh, and I think you are correct. I think that there's obviously some sort of compromise uh, whenever you're polling the public. Um, yes. Maybe it'd be interesting to see you do your polls on YouTube and Instagram and do like Instagram versus YouTube. Yes. I mean, that'd be kind of cool. 
I, I have a very, I think I have a very different audience on Instagram versus YouTube. So like oh, really? I need to start doing that. Yeah. Um, Instagram is more female dominant in general. Hmm. Whereas my YouTube channel, my subscriber base is 85, 15 male to female. Really? Yes. I think that's more male than my channel. I. That surprises it's me. It's been extremely male from the very beginning. In fact, 85, 15. In fact, before Wheel of Time, I got it down to 80, 20. And then after Wheel of Time, it just like went back up. <laughs> Whereas my Instagram, like I don't have those stats, I don't think on Instagram. But like for the people who talk to me, at least it's more majority female. So. <laughs> That's so interesting to me. Um, I mean, so whenever you pull, what would you expect the results to change? Like, is there would there be a certain response you would expect from the YouTube crowd? I mean, it depends on the poll. Maybe more um, hostile? Yes. YouTube is way more hostile. Like, way more hostile. Because if you follow me on Instagram, I think you at least, like, like me a little bit. So like, you're not generally hostile to me. But on YouTube, people have no problem being hostile. So... <laughs> <laughs> that would feel different, maybe <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, they they definitely uh, they're they're not afraid to step up to the plate and throw out some hot takes in the comments. That's for sure. Not at all. Uh, and and I don't think it's a hot take to say that uh, a lot of female creators put up with a lot more than male creators uh, when it comes yeah. to comments. Leanna and I talk about that a lot, actually. <laughs> <We're> yeah. <laughs> like it's just for, I think it just starts earlier because a lot of at least um, my or my male creator friends said that they didn't start until they had a few thousand followers. Yeah. Um, and mine was like from the very beginning, I get really mean comments. Really? From the oh, jump? Yeah, yeah, from the jump. Uh, that's 95%. That's a lot. I assumed it was just because I focus so much on adult high fantasy. Um, I never really go into YA, which tends to be a little bit more female dominated. Yeah. So um, I think that's the reason. I don't know. So you're not a fan of YA at all? Or have you, like, do you dabble? I don't dabble. I, I, don't I did read Six of Crows because of the show. I was like, I gave that a try. And I was oh, like, yeah, you told me that. Really yeah, you told yeah. me that. I, did, did, I mean, it was enjoyable. It was fine. I like Lee Bardugo. I, I know that, that that isn't a super duper popular opinion, I think, on the adult sphere. But I read Ninth House and actually really enjoyed it. Uh, there was some, some stuff in there. I was like, this is a little odd. Um, and if you've read the book, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, but I am not against reading six of crows because I actually did enjoy the first episode of shadow and bone. I thought it was really, really good. Yeah. I enjoyed the whole season, which is, I, I didn't read shadow and bone because Leanna warned me like, you're real. You're just not, you're not going to like it. Um, <laughs> it's just my mom. <laughs> um, but, uh, six of crows. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I mean, it was, it was still YA and I don't, I have no problem with YA. I just, read so much in my youth that I oh, have okay. just moved beyond it. Like, unlike some people who got into fantasy later in life, I have been into fantasy from like the moment I read anything. Bef before it was cool. Well, yeah, I guess so. Before it was cool. <laughs> I was a loser. Now it's, it's about having a brief period of cool. So that's great for me. I'm loving that. Um, but yeah, so I think I just read so much YA that I'm just like, I've kind of moved on from it. Not like it's bad. It's just, yeah, you, yeah, you just grew out of yeah. it. Yeah. I grew out of it pretty much. I think it's really interesting when authors um, who are YA authors that you can recognize from back in the day kind of grow up with their audience and yes. like Lee Bardugo published an adult fantasy book. I don't know how well Ninth House did. Uh, she hasn't written book two yet, so that's probably not a good sign. Uh, but I wonder if she would make the transition or if other YA authors um, would transition uh, to, to adult fantasy, because I think you're right. I mean, I think a lot of people go back to it for the nostalgia. Yes. But then generally do just end up enjoying adult fantasy more. My wife is a prime example. So she got back into reading. Obviously, when I started the channel, I'm mm -hmm. constantly throwing recommendations at her. And she she liked YA stuff. She was she was a pretty big reader when she was younger. And now when she got it back into reading, she picked up YA again. And she's like, this just isn't that great. Like, what from adult should I try? And then we've, you know, we've went through all the recommendations. Now she's reading Hob and having a great time. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. having a great time or like it's a good book, but having a bad time. It's bad boy time, but it, <laughs> but it, it's a good time nonetheless. Yes. There's some um, happy tears. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because I can revisit why I already read in my youth and enjoy it just as much as I did. Like the nostalgia is there, but just reading like new YA. And I, I think some people just love to write that. But at some yeah. point, some adults just start feeling hard to relate to the struggles of a teenager and YA is written for teenagers about their struggles. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But like, yeah. It's hard know. to relate to. Um, yeah. Because now, now we know that we've grown up. The world was, in fact, not ending. 
uh, and it wasn't coming down on our heads after our first breakup. <laughs> and well, yeah. And like, you got to deal with other crap now. That's not as fun. <laughs> yeah. Like bills. And I had a leak. I had a leak this week oh, and gosh. of course it's right on top of my bookshelves. <laughs> like oh, it couldn't have been oh anywhere in the house. Am Did I it ruin your books? No. No, thankfully. Actually, we were talking uh, before the stream. I said, I wish I didn't have backs on my bookcases. In this case, I was glad I had it. Saved backs. Your life. <laughs> Sa it saved my way of King's Leather Bound. So, oh uh, my gosh. I would have been a little upset. I would have been a little bit upset. R.L. Stein is young adult. And I did like R.L. Stein back in the day. That was is like that my Goosebumps? Jam. Yeah, Goosebumps was my jam back in the day. Goosebumps, those are good. But what's your favorite uh, YA book from your past? Oh gosh, geez. Um, okay, that's a heavy question. Uh, <laughs> I'll say a few. Um, like Gail Carson Levine. That might have been a little bit more middle grade. Did you read any like Ella Enchanted, Two Princes of Bar Mare? Mm -mm. No, uh, I haven't. Those even heard were like it. my jam back in the day. Um, fantasy. Uh, Two Princes of Bar Mare was the first book that made me cry. Uh, my little nine or 10 year old me. That's a great poll question. What was the first book that made you that cry? Made you cry. Yeah, yeah. It's like a good, it's a good question. Um, you know, hunger games, obviously I was very into hunger games and, um, some books people have never heard of like lost magic. Lost magic was a book that is like out of print. Now I actually had to like search it down, uh, to get it. But I used to, I checked that out of the library like six times. I'd always go to the library and just check that out. Uh, so you want to be a wizard. Have you heard of any of these? Like they're so. I heard of Hunger Games. <laughs> <laughs> there's no niche because I used to just go to the library and just pick books off the wall. Were you, um, shelf so were, was... were you cover picking? Uh, Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. I mean, I feel like most of like the middle grade and YA books have pretty good covers because mm -hmm. they know that kids our age are going to like look at the covers. Um. I oh love the Jedi Apprentice series. Are you a Star Wars fan at all? That was like a kid Star Wars book. Star Wars is a weird one for me. So um, I kind of got on the hype train with the Disney movies, right? And okay. I like. I don't think they're the greatest film in the world, but like I had fun watching them. Like I just watched them very passively, and I and I remember going to work and everyone's getting hyped up uh, about the third one. And I was like, oh, I like really enjoyed these Disney movies for what they were. And people were like, you're an idiot and you should hate them. And then and then it just got to be like this experience where like I felt like I wasn't allowed. To, like the fun of it was tearing it down, which yeah. I can respect that. I get that. Um, but it kind of soured my experience on Star Wars. I did watch I mean, the original trilogy and, and really loved that. It was um, it is upsetting when you initially said that you did not watch the original trilogy first. That does upset me slightly. I'm trying to not let it upset me. It is a little bit. <laughs> That's okay. That's fine. okay though. Fine. But fine. I don't think, I think it's weird when Star Wars, I mean, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Like, really yeah. huge. From yeah. You've, was... you've dressed up like Layla a few times, right? Or yeah. Leia. To go see the movies. Um, I, I, um, I think it's weird when people like hate that people enjoyed the Disney films. Because I feel like if you come into the Disney films not knowing anything about Star Wars, there is no reason you wouldn't enjoy them. Like, that's the thing. Like, I think it's only, star wars fans who don't mm -hmm. like them so i think i just hate fans who can't let people enjoy things like just because i don't like it doesn't mean someone else can't enjoy those movies they're not like the worst thing ever created there's yeah and there's of tons of plot holes and like i could see all of this but i was like i, I wasn't expecting like a masterpiece you know what i mean i was expecting yeah, well, oohs and, and ahs and i was like cinematography i mean it's such a gorgeous movie yeah like, even if i didn't like the plot like just it's a gorgeous movie i mean Yes, the throne room anyway. uh, scene in oh. The Last Jedi. I, I know that there's apparently a breakdown of why it's not good. I don't care. I like No, it. no, no. Cool. That scene is amazing. We can agree on that. Dope. I, <laughs> I freaking dope. love that. I think it's probably, that was probably my favorite part of the whole sequel trilogy, I think. Yeah, and I love the uh, the OG trilogy were great movies. And I really enjoyed uh, the third one. And everyone told me that that was also wrong. And then I'm that like, That is not I, wrong. The third like, one I is the best, win. Jimmy. I can't Don't listen win. to them. <laughs> then the prequels were like, I don't know. They were movies. I they were fine. You're kind of starting me on. I'm sorry. I ha I just Go. I really like talking about Star Wars. Um, here's the thing. First of all, the third one's amazing, and everyone who gets butt hurt about the Ewoks can go be butt hurt somewhere else. They're amazing and they're cute and adorable, and I love them. Uh, two, the prequels were better if you watched them as a kid, because like the first one came out when I was ten, and can you imagine a ten year old watching a movie about like pod racing, like a ten year old? Oh yeah. Like. That was just my like shiz. 
Yeah, that was the epic. Like, like that, everything. like I had a pod racing video game. I was like dressing up like Obi-Wan Kenobi. I had collected all the Pepsi cans, the action figures. Like that movie was my jam. As an adult, do I watch it and realize it's not a very good movie? Yes. <laughs> but like for it, like those were the Star Wars movies I feel like that were made for kids. Like, yeah. I don't know. Um, That's kind of how I went into the Disney. I kind of said this is like a G rate. I don't even think it was G rated though. But I said like G this, maybe? a lot of kids are going to be screaming and that's cool. Yeah. I'm down. Like that's fine. Yeah, I'm actually showing the original trilogy to my son right now for the first time. So we showed him numbers four and five and Alex, <laughs> you suck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so that's been super, super fun. But yeah, I'm not a maniac. So I'm showing him the original trilogy. Jimmy is where you should start. <laughs> You know, and the numbering doesn't help its case. I'm just saying. That's it's it. chaos. Yes, it's chaos. Here's the horn showing up to show some support. Uh, shout out to Here's the Horn, uh, Sir Matt and Ezra. Uh, the backdrop here for Chatting with Nuts that you see, uh, like the layout, that was done by Sir Matt from Here's the Horn, Ooh. Ben Denise. So, uh, Matt, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And Like, uh, did they come to your house or did they tell you what, like, tell me more Oh, no, no. This. I mean, like, the graphic that says fantasy oh, up here. Oh, that Matt thing? has made this. He also made me one oh, for Berserk sweet. that is really cool. Um, so I got confused and thought Matt. he came to your house and like did your bookshelves and I got really excited, but I, I love your fantasy network background well, as well. Well, I am um, going to be hanging out with Sir Matt in like two weeks. We're both going to vacation in the same area and that'll be a lot of fun. There'll be some pints That's shared and sweet. Yeah, it's it's interesting. So I started out uh, becoming a fan of Bend the Knee, which is their song of Ice and Fire podcast. They were covering season eight of Game of Thrones, which was like everything at the time. Right. Um, and I was just a listener. And then uh I decided to offer to make them a website because they they like blew up during season eight. They got over I'm a million sure. downloads. They were in, for, I think, Forbes, all this crazy stuff. And I just love these two guys, the way they were talking. It felt like two friends, you know, kind of felt like this very casual. Um, and they were definitely a little less extreme than some of the other podcasts, like screaming how much they hated everything. I mean, they still had criticisms, but I thought that they were pretty chill. So um, I offered to make them a website. And we got to talking and then they kind of helped me get started on YouTube with my channel. And like, we've become like really good friends. So that's so cool. Yeah. Isn't that great when you meet the people through the community, like that's obviously the best part. Oh, it's without a doubt. Yeah. The best part. I talk about it all the time with my wife about how the connections I've made through booktube. like I could have never done this anywhere else. And it's like the one place you can go and you don't have to worry about like all the other things in the world. Like you can just talk about the things you like the or fun dislike. things. Yeah. And sometimes <laughs> right. it's, sometimes it's honestly even more fun to disagree. Like when me and Alan disagree, yes. I think it's a blast. Um, but Leanna's friendship, me and Leanna's friendship is like based on disagreement because we don't like any of the same books. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, Leanna doesn't like any books. Uh, well, so <laughs> we liked American gods. She liked the feast for crows this time. I was very, I was very, you know, cool. I yeah, I can't watch any of those because I haven't read A Song of Ice and Fire. But I do feel like slowly, like Kyle and Leanna, and now she claims you are getting on this train. I just have a bunch of people who are bullying me to read A Song of Ice and Fire. Oh, like, well, I'm, just... I'm not going to bully you into anything. <laughs> but um, we talked about, I mean, obviously. That's not as graphic as First Law is what she told me. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I think the implications of the graphic nature of the world is there. But Abercrombie goes into a little bit more detail. Um, I would say that the romantic uh, scenes are not the best. Uh, they can be very, uh, they can be too much. And that's coming I mean, from I someone. Skip it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't blame you. <laughs> I wouldn't blame you. Um, this, is, this is my biggest problem because I will admit I spoiled the first book for myself because I was doing a Bad Blurbs live show and I really wanted to do a Game of Thrones ones. And so I was like, well, I'm never going to read it. And I read the Wikipedia article and it, the Wikipedia article was so interesting that it almost convinced me to go read the book. I feel like if a Wikipedia plot summary was interesting Please, enough. If you read the books, I would love to do any type of content with you as you do that. Because seeing someone who's like a legit first time reader. But, oh but. No. Oh no. How can you convince me? to start the series when I know it will never be finished. This isn't just like starting a series and hoping it, it like oh, that's it fair. will not be finished. Are, are, are you someone that needs the definitive end? Um, I mean, not necessarily, but it just becomes such a cultural talking point. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, it's <clears> like, well, we'll Game of Thrones will never be finished. And I know for certain I will never watch a show because the show is way too graphic. Like that is just not something I enjoy. Yeah. So I won't even have like the bad show ending. So it just feels hard to like. 
yeah. want to start something I know won't end. But like, I'm not someone who usually cares about that. Like I'll start a new series all the time. So like, I just don't know how much it's going to bug me. That's my worry. I think that, um, yeah, as everyone here is saying, and uh, Joanna you guys saying, would it. say that. Well, I could tell you that Alex, you know, when we first started realizing, like, why am I doing this? That he's never going to finish. These are silly, but like, it is something to be it? said about the experience of those books just by themselves. I think. Does um, it? Does the fifth book end on a cliffhanger? Sure does. Okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, at the very minimum, you know, um, you'll, you'll be disappointed by the cliffhanger for sure. But <laughs> okay. I, I mean, I'm not going to force anyone to read anything they don't. No, want. I know. No. I, I would, know. I would love if you did because I, I enjoy watching. Your I content. do feel left out. I feel left out on booktube not having read it. Eh, I mean, I feel that way with a lot of stuff. Uh, like Wheel of Time. Like I, I kind of quit at book five. Which Petrick, my buddy, who's been on like the Wheel of Time DNF team, picked up Fires of Heaven. <laughs> Stab me in the back. What are you doing, Patrick? Oh my gosh. He read and he was like complimentary of the book. The like, wheel you... of time content was too tempting. I just felt like when the wheel of time show came out, I was like, finally, this is my time. I've read something. <laughs> my time to rise. <laughs> well, you've done a great job. Uh, you know, uh between uh, I mean, a lot of people are making content. Here's the horn I I've loved. Um, and then watching your takes have been really interesting because I think that you've done a pretty balanced approach coming at it from as a book reader, but also acknowledging that the success doesn't just hamper on the book audience. It's very important to get off the ground, but you can continue because I'll, I'll be honest, a lot of the song and fire fans were off the bandwagon in season five because season yeah. five, they just totally changed everything. Um, so. I From think what I've that, heard, though, with A Song of Ice and Fire, people didn't get really mad until like season seven and eight, right? Yeah, I think six had a, a six had some amazing moments, but people were a little bit concerned. Uh, I would say people who like were really into the books, like before the show, were pretty mad by season five, and mm -hmm. specifically at one thing in season. Were four. you mad by season five, or did you watch first? Uh, so I I tried to read it one time way back in the day. Uh, didn't continue with it because I was kind of out of reading. Watched the show, didn't like the show at first. How about that? Um, okay interesting then watch season one finally like sat down and watched it right watched it and i was like what <laughs> and then i i read this the book amazing. yeah so it was it i kind of hooked me from there and it really changed my relationship with media mm. uh, in a lot of ways and one of the reasons why is because coming from a wrestling background uh we're telling stories with physical violence i watched you know, some of your videos i'm sorry to hear that uh <laughs> No, I loved it because you told me it was about stories and I would have never understood that because I just like don't really watch wrestling. So that was really fun to see like, oh, they're like setting like they're setting something up. Yes. And and there's there's a ebb and flow to a, a, a story in a wrestling match. Right. Uh, you have the good guy who comes out and this is the same as movies. You see the good guy shine up. Right. So you, mm -hmm. you have a reason to cheer for him. Like you need a reason to get behind your protagonist. Uh, and then the antagonist does something dirty and cheap to make you dislike him. And then he stays up on on the good guy for a while. And then you have to give hope spots. They're called to continue to have. Cause at some point you just say, I give up on this guy. He's never going to win. So you have to keep your baby. We call him a baby face. Good guy alive. <laughs> and a song of ice and fire was the first time where I didn't feel like there was ever any hope spots. And to me, that's bad storytelling from, from a wrestling perspective, but I was looking for the wrong things because I had been trained for certain things to come up in stories that tell me that a guy is good, uh, that, that a character is good and that they're going to be okay. And that they're going to overcome where this, my opinions on who were good and bad were changing as, as it evolved. And if I think back to all of the, um, you know, and I don't mean to make this all about wrestling, but wrestlers that transcended the, the sport of re or theatrics of wrestling are ones that blurred the lines between good and bad. And I just said, Oh, like, this is a different type of storytelling. And obviously, in literature, that had been done before. Um, George definitely had a big uh, push to the forefront because of how popular it became. Uh, but as someone who wasn't reading all at the time, that was a very different take for me. Uh, and it just it hooked me. It hooked me. I started thinking about my wrestling character in a different mindset. It really helped me a lot. So I have, like, a deep attachment. Were you still wrestling when you read it? Yes. Okay. So it was, like, it was near the end of my career. So it was, like, 2014, 15. Oh, uh, yeah, no, May maybe 14, 13. I can't remember <laughs> to make concussion. I, I believe you. <laughs> what, what's interesting to me is that what you just described there is actually what Wheel of Time did for me. Wheel of Time was really my first adult fantasy. And it was the first time I was confronted with this novel more later on. I don't know when you quit, but like it wasn't telling me who were the good guys and who were the bad guys. 
And it was frustrating me at first coming from YA, where it was always very clear who was good and who was bad and who was making good decisions and who was making bad decisions and confronting this new storytelling where they weren't telling me how to feel. And there were a lot of different ways you could feel that would be right, really changed my reading habits completely. And even just because wheel time gets really boring and really slow, like helped me become a better reader. Like I truly think it, like it yeah. helped me appreciate like, okay, sometimes I'm just going to sit in the details of a story without it just being fast. You just don't get that in YA frequently. I think YA is changing a little bit now, but like back in the day, um, it wasn't like that. Yeah, which is interesting that you say why it's changing to go towards that. Whereas I feel like a lot of modern adult fantasy has kind of become shorter, a little bit more. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Consumable. Uh, yeah, cons that's a phenomenal word choice. That's why you're the best in the biz, because I couldn't have thought of that. <laughs> so, um, but, but it is interesting you're saying that because like YA is starting to come up a little bit while adult. I'm, and I'm not saying adult fantasy is on the way down or anything, but no, it does. No, I know seem what like, you mean. It does seem like it is a little bit more consumable. Uh, great word, phenomenal word. Um, I, I, do wanna... I have not read any Scott Baker, I don't think. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> Darren, is... thanks for the thanks for the ten spot. Uh, do, uh, the, yeah, book porn is probably not going to read our Scott Baker. <laughs> okay, what did he write? Would... Tell me, I do. Prince I'll of Nothing. Do I like what is it? The Prince of Nothing series. It's oh, uh, I have heard of that. It's like the Grim Dark series. I've read yeah, the trilogy. No. Don't read it. Yeah, I won't. Um, I know I don't enjoy dark reads. Uh, Abercrombie is the only dark read I've ever read that I enjoyed. And I think it's just because he is so funny and his characters are so good. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely. So and, and some people I know that I have a lot of R. Scott Baker fans. I'm not telling book not to read R. Scott Baker because I think it's bad. I love it. I think it's phenomenal writing. I love this. You just the story. know I wouldn't. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah, I know your reading tastes. And because we both like uh, Abercrombie. You yes. know, who's a little bit of a more mainstream take on Grimdark, in my opinion, yes, for sure, uh, which actually was something I wanted to bring up because I find myself to be a bit of a nihilist where you're an, you're optimistic, like you're very, yes. you're, you know, very positive. And we talked about this on the Abercrombie stream, but we both met in the middle. And we said we both we're enjoying this. And I think that that's pretty and like, that tells a lot about Abercrombie's approach to to writing that we both can enjoy it having such opposite worldviews. Yeah. And I think part of it is also just Abercrombie being such an excellent writer. And the biggest thing that he does is one issue I've had with some other dark reads I've read, um, Grim Dark, is that they use violence against women in a way that I just don't really appreciate um, as, an, mm -hmm. as a story ends to the mean and not really giving those characters voice, which is something Abercrombie never does and something I appreciate a lot as a female reader. Um, and so I think that's another reason I've enjoyed his take on Grim Dark a lot more. Yeah. Um, just I appreciate that about his writing style. Yeah, he's definitely very conscious of what oh, he's doing. Oh no, wait, I can't hear you. Oh no. Oh, hold on a second. As, can you uh, still hear me? Yep, I can still hear you. I think my. Uh, sorry, hold on a second. You're all. You're you're good. Uh, Did they die? Oh yeah, I think my AirPods died. Okay. Rip. Here you now. I'm gonna go plug in new uh, headphones though, so we don't get echo. No, you're good. I'm. Uh... We'll do a... See, now we match. This looks much better. Yeah. The aesthetic is good. The same page here. I did see uh, Jake was saying that I lost Patrick to the other side of the wheel time equation, but I still have Alan. So I think that that counts for a lot. You still got Alan. That's all that matters. Okay, let's see if I can figure this out here. Um, I don't know. Test one, two. <laughs> this is not working. I hope, is it echoing really bad? I, I don't hear myself yet. I'll let you know. Let me know if you hear, if you hear, no. and then I'll try to get these headphones to work. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm so unprepared. No, you're fine. It's totally chill. I started out my, uh, my biggest interview ever with Erickson started out with three minutes of echoing and oh. I, uh, and uh, it, was, it was May day and we got through it and we had a great time. Um, no, they're not working. Oh, Leanna does like books. Is that, that's a hot Leanna take. does like books and she's convinced me to like some of her books, but likes less books. I do want to read the, uh, the wolf is what she was, uh, raving about at one point. I thought it sounded really good. The sequel's called like the spider. I can't remember who wrote it, but I thought it sounded really good. Okay. My tech support came in. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, okay. We did it. All right. We did it. Now we have matching headsets. This is beautiful. Um, but we were talking about, uh, 
yeah, Abercrombie not uh, really going into using uh, specifically women as devices to show off how brutal a world is. Um, and I, I, I would say that's correct. I think Abercrombie is very conscious of what he's trying to accomplish and what he's trying to get across. And a lot of times I see people like they'll read Abercrombie and say, you know, I didn't like this book because of this thing. And I I just think, well, that was the that was the point. Like he that's actually was crit he was critiquing. <laughs> these things um yes. i had a conversation with someone who said you know the heroes for me this the the snootiness of the generals that were waiting around for this battle to happen just drove me crazy and then he heard abercrombie actually read a page from the heroes and he went oh he meant them to be very snooty like that was the point he was making fun of them uh but he needed to hear it narrated to know yeah to know which is and this and this person is extraordinarily intelligent like edits and, and does all these crazy things so for them to you know be like oh yeah i kind of missed it i thought that was interesting but i think we all miss things sometimes you know it's hard not time. to all the time and then everyone lets me know <laughs> yeah well one thing about youtube they'll let you know yeah if you didn't understand something <laughs> so yeah especially in uh berserk berserk has so many little details since i bet it's my first manga really and uh i've had so many people but really nice but i've had a couple people who point out things and they say you know you need to do a better job i'm like I'm manga doing fans as, <laughs> i'm doing as well as i can i just started my first manga well not my first manga but my first manga in a long time um haikyuu have you heard of that one it's the volleyball I one I have not, but Star was going to ask if you had uh, done much in the way of graphic novels, manga, and comics. Um, well, I just started Haikyuu. I cannot believe I'm reading a sports story. If people want to know, um, do I like sports? No. You don't um, like sports ball. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like sports ball. Yeah. Uh, that IT scene is, or IT crowd scene, if you guys have seen it, is, yeah, that's pretty good for me. Um, I mean, I did. I did. I mean, I was into watching college sports for a while, but anyway. So, but so many people told me this was such a good manga. It's about volleyball. Um, but I actually liked it. I liked it. I'm going to read it again. Um, I'm going to read more volumes. It's just expensive. Yeah. Uh, it's like I, you read them fast and they're really expensive and they have like a hundred volumes. So yeah, that. that's why you got to get the box. Have you seen these box releases manga does? Yes. They're so cool. Why don't we have that for books? I want they're that also for books. just like so expensive. I mean, less expensive than buying Very them individually. Expensive. But um, I did read some dot hack sign back in the day. If anyone knows that uh, anime, which got turned into a manga. I do not. I am well, so new to this realm. Uh, I, I went through an anime phase. So I watched like dot hack sign and Yu Yu Hakusho and, you know, Sailor Moon and all that stuff. And I, um, oh, yes, dot hack. Thank you, Alan. Um, but I haven't, I haven't done it in a long time. So I'm kind of like maybe getting back into it. I don't know. Is Bridge Four a sports story? No. That isn't that what uh, Sanderson said. It's kind of like you know, remember the Titans. But okay, I mean, we all like remember the Titans. You know, we it's all like those classic movie. sports movies. Okay, we've all watched whatever Rudy and all that stuff. But like, yeah, see, yeah. there's a lot of dot hack lovers. Yeah, there's a there, there's some dot. Everyone's going on. I I don't <laughs> know Yu any of this. Yes, Yu Yu Hakusho. Now, my funny story about Yu Yu Hakusho is like this was back in the uh, you know. What do you call the olden times? The olden times where like <laughs> there wasn't the internet. So it was on every Monday night at 5 p.m. And I'd rush home from piano lessons to go watch it. And then it got moved. And so I just never finished the show because I never knew when it was on again. Like that was the grim reality of TV. Yes. And now our children, they get to just go on Netflix and finish a series whenever they want. Oh, I remember. So I was the only anime I was ever into was Dragon Ball Z. Okay, and let me tell you classic. what. I I bursted blood vessels in my forehead trying to go super sand in my backyard. Right. <laughs> and I remember like, I never knew when the new season was coming on. Cause no. like, I just, I just didn't understand the world, I guess. <laughs> no. So I knew it was on like five 30. It was a replay at five 30 and a play at six. And like, sometimes I would miss it. Cause I'd be playing with friends or I'd have to go to like the store with my parents. And <laughs> if you missed it, I had to wait for the whole season to play through. And then they would wait like three months and then replay the season like in the summer. And I would just have to wait. And I'm like, you I don't know what happened. To go on, like, and, I and like when know. I, and then you'd find the show again, and it's been like two months, and you have no idea who anybody is because these anime shows go so fast. So anyway, I did to using cable, not to using a television, to using cable, which like is not a thing anymore, <laughs> in my opinion. Isn't there digital access for manga for subscription? I think it, there is, but I hate. Uh, there is no way I'm going to read a graphic novel online. That is just going to make me very unhappy. 
I, I will say this. So I, I, uh, I did a sample on my phone for Vinland before I got into it. And it was really cool being able to go to the panel to panel view. Cause like you just oh, okay. hit it because getting into manga, I'm going to be honest folks. I didn't know it was backwards. So I was like trying to figure this out and I'm like, this is very difficult. Like I do not know what I'm doing here. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it was funny because I knew it was, I'd read it previously, but it, it takes a second. It just it oh, yeah. takes a second to get you in the mindset of reading right like you miss some panels like I, you miss it for a little bit yeah for sure and even now sometimes when i'm reading through if i'm going a little bit quicker i will notice that like i'm like oh wait did i go to the right panel like i have to look at the borders yes. and figure it out i feel <laughs> yes. very dumb very dumb when i read manga <laughs> um dragon ball z did not go fast <laughs> yeah well i you know back we were just talking about how wheel time has slow parts i learned to appreciate the slower the slow part the full episodes of Dragon Ball where people are screaming. Uh, and that's the whole episode. That was my favorites. Full Metal um, Alchemist. I know everyone talks about Full Metal Alchemist. I'm sure I will get to it eventually because I've heard so many good things. I just, um, watch it zero. <laughs> um, the graphic novel format just isn't necessarily my favorite. Like, I enjoy it. I prefer reading a text. It's the same as I don't really listen to a lot of audiobooks. Like, I actually just like the process of reading. Yeah. I've um, I've been wanting to try the Sandman graphic novels because I've heard, heard not one bad thing about them. Have you read them? I have not, but uh, Liana talked to me about mm -hmm. how she was convinced she wasn't going to like them and then did. So I've heard a lot. Yeah, I feel like I would definitely like to dive into that. But I've also heard that the audio is phenomenal. Like people are like, oh, just well, do that's the what audio. she did. She listened to the oh. audio and looked at the pictures at the same time. So she highly recommends doing that. Um, but I'll probably just read it <laughs> because I yeah. just on, on my scale, like audio is the very last, like I'd rather read graphic really? novels and manga and audio is very, very last. That's interesting. So, I mean, I definitely rely on audio a lot of times, uh, to, to help get through books, right. Just mm -hmm. because of time. Uh, how many books do you usually read in a month? Um, I, I don't know if I can admit that to booktube online because I'm so slow. Because I don't listen oh, to no, audio. No, no, this is good. This is good because a lot of people, like I'll say, oh, I read seven books this month. And, and then people are like, oh, well, that sucks. I only read two. And I'm like, nah, trust me. You're fine. Like, <laughs> I read about four to five. I think that's um, perfectly good. Like, that's yeah, great. I mean, usually four, sometimes five, depending on like length, obviously. Like I read The Little Mermaid this month, which was like a 70 page book. So like, obviously um, I read more. But yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, you know, one a week about. I think that one a week is a great pace for someone that's reading a lot, right? Yeah, um, that's how, I mean, that's how I felt. Like, let me be clear. Before I started a booktube and a bookstagram, I thought I was an insane reader. I read like three books a month, three to four, maybe four, <laughs> maybe. And I was like, man, I read more than every person I know in real life. And then I get on the book internet and it's like, I finished 360 books this year. And I was like, okay cool i'll go hide my head in shame <laughs> <laughs> well i i would like to always stay around four to five uh and i always say five because i usually read like a shorter book like i try to fit a shorter book in yeah, that's and that's what i do too because like i'll read four normal and then usually like a manga or a short or a novella yeah. yeah um do you feel like you enjoy books when you take your time more with them or do you feel like you enjoy them whenever you can just binge depends on the book yeah like, um, you know, I've been really into Dandelion Dynasty. That's really just not a book I can binge. You've got so, me hyped for it. Oh, my oh, goodness. So good. I'm so um, hyped. Like, me and Kyle are going to read the last one together, and we kind of have to wait to a moment where we have time, because that I'm that's going to take me two weeks. Like, it's just yeah. not a book that I can, not because I'm not enjoying it. I love it. I just kind of need to savor it a little bit. But yeah. like a Sanderson, I'm like, I'm going to sit down and just like power through that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's definitely like about how it's written is definitely a big piece of it. For this, A Song of Ice and Fire reread, I've kind of just been doing a little bit every day if mm -hmm. I can. And I have just, uh, man, like you kind of like savor each moment because you know it's the only piece you're going to read that day. Um, but for instance, I'm reading the Brian Staveley, uh, the first book, uh, The Emperor's Blades and the Unhewn Throne trilogy for Alan's oh, read along yes. on his channel. And I can read, I, I mean, I've, I think I'm going to finish that in like four days. It's like 470 pages. It's not crazy, but it, the writing's just, it keeps you going yeah it's pretty straightforward uh i wouldn't say that it's the quickest paced book in the world but it, it's just one of those things it's kind of easy to digest and read and i've been doing some on audio which helps a lot um but i definitely rely on audio i, I didn't know that you uh weren't super duper into audio now in fact i had not read an audiobook ever until i got 
on to book two. Well, that's like Alan Allen's the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Last year, I read a record five audiobooks because of book two. I listened to five audiobooks and I have not been convinced that I am missing out on anything. It is helpful in some ways. Like, um, well, I guess this was two or three years ago. I listened to the Hamilton biography um, after seeing Hamilton because I wanted to know all the differences um, between that. That's like, I need people to understand. People think I did this Wheel of Time difference thing because I wanted engagement. No, I just do this in my regular life. Like I read the Hamilton biography just because I wanted to personally know how accurate the Hamilton play was. Hmm. But that was a really difficult... I couldn't have read that on my own. There's no way. It was like 1,200 pages and I am not a history person. <laughs> so listening to that, like that is the kind of book that I appreciate. Like I like to listen to like nonfiction if I'm going to do it. Um, yeah. Or like I listen to The Count of Monte Cristo, something that's like really long and is going to be difficult for me to sit down and like want to read. Yeah. But other than that, like I like the physical act of reading. And I also, I also daydream a lot. So like if I'm listening, <laughs> my mind can be somewhere else and it's pretty hard in an audio to go back to where you started daydreaming. Yeah, having to go back, especially if you're listening <laughs> at a little bit of a higher speed, it can be a big pain. Oh, and I cannot do high speed. My max, my max is 1.5. If I make it to 1.5, it means I'm understanding and vibing with the audio author. Yeah, it yes. all depends on the narrator <laughs> for me. Um, sometimes I can crank it way up. It just depends. I definitely listen to it anytime I have like a commute, like when I'm going to jujitsu, mm -hmm. it's like 20 minutes or so. So that's 40 minutes of listening, which is great. That's so um, great. I wish, I wish I could do that. But like I zone out when I'm driving. I'm just, my brain is just somewhere else. I, I like, or I listen to a podcast because in a podcast you can just like zone out and it's fine. There's yeah. no narrative you're missing. Well, you know, it's interesting. So uh, you were talking about how you daydream when you read a lot. Uh, there was, I want to well, say. Only it was when this... I listen. I don't daydream when I physically read. This is why I can't Fair do enough. audio. <laughs> well, there, there's uh, an argument from someone and I can't remember where I saw this, but, and they were talking about the cadence of which people speak. And that's why podcasts are so much easier to listen to because it's a more natural oh. pace, which is why you do see a lot of people turn up the speed in their audiobooks because it actually mimics, mimics real conversation. Interesting. I had never heard that before. I have found that when I turn up my speed, I'm not doing 3.5 or anything crazy, but when I turn up my speed, I do pay attention more. Interesting. Okay. So yeah. I was thinking like, I'm too bad at this. I can't turn it up, but maybe turning it up would help a little bit. It could definitely, especially like, I mean, some authors just like Roy Detroit or Detrice from A Song of Ice Fire, who's already struggling to pronounce all the names in the series. He, he reads so <laughs> slow. I'm not even doing an impersonation. It's me. <laughs> but you can listen to him on 2.5. Like that's how oh, slow, man. that's how slow he talks. I was um, doing my rereads last year of um, Second Era of Mistborn because I want to do some content on that. And I didn't want to take the time to like actually reread them. And he's famous. What's his name? He's a famous audiobook narrator. Me? Oh, me? I thought oh, me. <laughs> you. You are famous. No. Um, I don't know. Whoever does all of the Sanderson audio, someone tell me. I forget who he is. Someone will know. Um, it's Kate Reading's the, the woman who does it. And I forget the guy. But anyway. His voice was so insane. I couldn't even listen. On, I had to put, oh, Kramer, Michael Kramer. I had to put oh, him yeah. down to one because I could not understand his voice any higher than at one speed. <laughs> like, <so>. because, <laughs> like, I could not understand him, like, as a speaker. So like, many I people. <laughs> I know. Z, they all knew. I'm and, the... you said, and you said you couldn't understand him. You're, you're about to just get burnt. This is going to oh, be. Oh, I, I said it on my Instagram. Um, and people didn't burn me too bad. There was more people being like, yeah, truth or this, I have been too scared to tell anyone I don't like Michael Kramer. And I was like, I am a safe spot for you to come tell me that you don't like Michael yeah. Kramer. <laughs> um, Kramer does speak very, very slow. Um, it's very, But you it's know, like, but if you should be able to speed it up, but it's so deep. His voice is so deep. It's, it's very, like, it's very distinct. <sighs> I got, I got to like 1.25 in the end. We, we made it there, <laughs> but like, I just, I just can't, I just. It's fine. I'm truthering that I'm not an audiobook person on book two, but it's a brave stance and I'm going to stick to it. No, I think that's cool. I mean, I will say this. You are right about the act of reading, like sitting down, turning my phone on, do not disturb and opening the book is one of the most peaceful yes. things I can do. Um, and, and I'm I, always, and I think, I'm always on my phone. Oh, I know. We've talked, we talked about yeah. this. Um, yeah. I think part of it too, is also just like personality traits. Like I've always, even in school, I learned better when I read from a book 
versus yeah. like hearing something told to me. Like, I just think it is my own personal brain style that I just like. Oh, definitely. That's that's a thing for sure. Like a learning style. People have learning styles. And I just I learn better through text, I think. I, I think I generally learn and we're not even talking about books at this point, but like like visualizing something on a screen does a lot for me. Mm. Um, YouTube videos like I could watch history like I mean, the driest stuff on YouTube. I can watch hours of it and I'll retain a lot mm. um, reading a history book. I still enjoy doing that. I won't retain much. I really See, I'm the know. opposite. Like this is what let's say I have a question. I need to okay. know how to do something on Final Cut Pro or like fix my dishwasher. I like hate it that they only serve me videos. I want to read I love the video. an article. I want to read an article. It's the video's too slow. I want to be able to read the article and picture. So the you thing Google that went. when you have a problem, you Google, right? I I Google it and you I Google want to it. read an article. I yes. YouTube it. I YouTube. No, it. I open up YouTube. No, and incorrect. I think, <laughs> how do I tie a tie for the one time a year I do this when someone I know dies or something? I'm like, I got to tie a tie. How do I do this? I mean, I, I, some things like that I can see are better visually. So like there's occasionally where something like tie and a tie, I'd probably need to see someone do it. But like yeah. an instruction in Final Cut Pro, oh my, do not show me a video of you doing this. I do not want to see this. Give oh, me I love a it. numbered list, a numbered list that I can read. I just like, I hate it so much. And that's why I can't even believe I'm a YouTuber. I don't even watch YouTube videos. <laughs> like that's the thing. <laughs> that's so funny to me because uh, I literally taught myself how to code just through videos and like i started out with books and i was having a really tough time like you know this is a this is how you print out something like what the world is this and i and i would get bored i couldn't retain anything um but then i go on youtube and i find a guy named Travis C media and he has like these really great tutorials and i learned how to code in like seven months i'm not like an amazing coder i can code in some languages but incorrect a book or an internet article is the correct way to learn <laughs> And it's how I learned. <laughs> I, 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 don't know if it's, I don't know if it's validation of seeing someone else able to actually just do the thing. Mm -hmm. um, but if I can see someone walk through the steps, I can say, okay, I can do that. And then from there, I do like, especially like coding, I like documentation. So mm -hmm. I'll go to a site and, and hammer through the documentation. Uh, but getting going on something, I almost always look for a video. That's so, so interesting. interesting. It's so opposite. So interesting. Like, um, for me, like even in school, like I think partly is like, I like to be able to remember where things are spatially on a page. So like I would make a study guide and when I was in a test, I could spatially remember where I had put it. Whereas like, yeah. a video or audio doesn't have that spatial awareness. Yeah. So I think it's a lot about spatial awareness uh, for me. Okay, Komodo Sanders uh, says, you both have good voices. Would either of you ever consider narrating an audiobook? I am, I, I actually really dislike reading aloud. It's like, I kind of get uh, anxiety about it. Uh, anytime I've done dramatic reading in any of my reviews, it like takes like 80 takes because I just start <laughs> stumbling. Uh, now, I think you would do a wonderful job. I'm so surprised to hear people say that because I think I have a terrible voice for like narrating. I talk way too fast. Like, I mean, maybe people, audio, but people would like that. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with that. Don't bother me. I, I think I am. Um, I mean, I was a TA for statistics in college. Um, I taught undergrad stats. And like, that was the only criticism I would ever get on my reports. Like, you're a great TA, but I cannot understand you like half the time because you talk so fast. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't know. I don't think I'd be very good at it. See, I, I don't even think that you talk fast, but maybe it's because I talk fast. I rant a lot. My poor yes. wife. has to, I, to I know. The poor, all the time. The poor spouses of YouTubers. Poor spouses. <laughs> oh, and Komodo Sanders is Chris Warman, which is author, uh, co-author of Seasons at Albedon, oh. which is available on Amazon right now. Um, well, I don't think I own that book. Yeah, self-pub and uh, was a semi-finalist in S. FPB. I, I always forget how it's FPFBO. I got yeah, really good at it. saying it because I have to make all the videos. Oh, well, this is probably a good time somewhere. for me to ask. Uh, tell me more about the indie fantasy fund that you and your husband have started. I would love to hear more about this. Yeah, can, I mean, can I tell us all about this. Yeah, indie fantasy fund. We're just giving away money to indie authors to help them do stuff like art and audiobooks and advertising and editing. Mostly just because Zach is a self-pubbed author and he was an SPFBO last year. So SPFBO six. And um, like we, st I mean, we, we do this stuff as a hobby. We don't, I don't expect to make money from my YouTube and he does not expect me to make money from writing books. Like we went into this being like, this is a hobby and you spend money on hobbies sometimes, you know, like yeah. when people ski, skiing is expensive. Like why is our hobby any different? Like Absolutely. they're expensive. 
but we were kind of blown away by how expensive self-publishing was. Um, like if you want to make it attractive to some, like there's just a lot more hurdles when you don't have a publishing house behind you, like getting good editing, yeah. getting good cover art, all this stuff um, that we learned. And then it just felt kind of like a bummer because we have that income that we can spend on our hobbies, but I feel really unfair to be like, well, you may be a good writer, but you can't afford to get an editor. So like sucks for you. Yeah. Um. So we've been talking about it for a long time. Like we really wanted a way to like help out. And so we just did it. And we're trying it out this year and doing indie fantasy fun. So I guess if you're an indie author in the, uh, in the chat, the applications are open till February 28th. Um, we're giving away $5,000 to five people. Well, $1,000 to five people. That's awesome. Um, yeah, good editing is very expensive. And um, it sure there's, is. there's something like I have talked about before on my channel where like sometimes you open a self-published book and you can immediately tell it's self-published because things aren't quite, there's like an uncanny valley about like, the text goes too close to the edge of the page and <laughs> things like that shouldn't matter, but they do. They like do. when someone opens your books and they see that it gives it an illegitimacy, even if your book is incredible. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's just trying to help people get that legitimacy that kind of like matters a lot in self-publishing. Yeah. Um, when it comes to self-publishing, cause like obviously you've, you've delved into a decent amount of it. Whenever you're approaching that work, do you go at it differently than traditionally published books that you read as far as reviewing it, forming your opinions? Like how, how do you weigh those things? Yeah, it's really hard. Um, I actually kind of hated being a judge for SPFBO because you just feel like you're crushing people's dreams if you don't like the book. Like I've never felt that way about a traditionally published book because one review doesn't tank a traditionally published book, but one review can tank a self-published yes. book. Yes. Um, and that's really hard, but I also want to be honest with people um, so the first thing I do is I'm pretty picky about the self-published I'll read. And I always try to tell the author, like, it's for your benefit because I want mm -hmm. to read a book that I'm going to like so that we can both have a positive experience with this rating. So I, I will, I'm, I do some research before I'll accept, uh, accept to read that if yeah. I'm going to give like a re if they're asking me for a video review. Otherwise, if I just read a self-published because I want to, I don't have to say anything if I don't like it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, yeah. I, I just, I can just kind of like, don't have to make a video on it. And I never will. I will never make a video on a self-published. I don't like, unless like it was SPFBO where I had to make a video on all the books. Yeah. I was pretty relieved. None of them were, <laughs> were bad. Like none of them were like, Oh, this is a bad book. They were all fine, <laughs> which is like, whew, never want to do it again though. Because yeah, it's, it's hard. And I, do I go into it differently? I don't know. Maybe I'm a little nicer. Yeah. It's hard not to be. The, the authors are so nice. Like, I just like, don't talk to me. You're too nice. Like, I don't want to get to know you. I don't, I don't want to be your friend. You're too nice. I don't want to review your book and tell you that it like wasn't amazing. <laughs> yeah. And, and also you, you want to give them the most true opinion because it helps. It, it helps yeah. them get better. Yeah. So it, it's, it, it's, it's a tricky balance. Um, I haven't read a ton of self-published. I'd like to get to more and I will, cause I'm going to keep reading. We both love sort of Kaigen. That, that's what I was going to say. I think as a reader and for folks who are listening to this say, Hey, I've never really tried self pub. It only takes one for you to kind of remove that bias. I think yes. because sort of Kaigen, I loved it. Um, so good. I, and it's I know my it's top five of this year. Uh, it was my fourth book for last year, I believe. Yeah. And I even said, I said on a different day, it might be number one. I don't think that it was like a perfect book. Like there was some stuff that probably could have maybe been edited out or changed, but yeah. man, what a story about motherhood. It and hits, the, yeah. Yeah. And the magic and the characters were so well realized. Like it's, it's insane to me that um, it's not talked about a little bit more. And I, I know that uh, she has uh, some stories being published in a Kickstarter of sorts. Uh, actually, oh. Chris, Chris shared it in my discord. I'll have to find that and share that I link out, that. Um, but really, really awesome. And I think once you have an experience like sort of Kaigen, or as Zach is saying, Combat Codes by Alexander Darwin. That was another one. It was very niche. That's another great thing about self-published is that if an author has a like genre niche that they want to go into, they don't have to worry about trends or yep. if it's commercially viable. I mean, Combat Codes is a jiu-jitsu fantasy. And I should say <laughs> MMA fantasy. It is so <laughs> fun. Like I had a blast uh, and I reviewed uh, all three of those. I think I reviewed the third one in a wrap up. Uh, and, you know, I had some things I didn't enjoy so much in the last two, but like overall, 
I had so much fun. Well, and the thing about Sorta Kai again, I think is one of the perfect examples of a self pub because the narrative structure is so interesting in Sorta Kai again, since it follows like a five act structure yes. instead of a three act. Yes. That is something that probably would not be regularly published, but works super well. So like you get to see more, um, like you said, like more chances taken because they are not answering to the same kind of people. And Joanna, I completely agree. One 100%. of my favorite mothers. In fact, there's three mothers in that book and they all represent a very important part of motherhood, which is why I like it so much. Yeah, there's actual multiple representation. It's, multiple. It's, it's not just, hey, here's the mom. Here's here's <laughs> the mom. The um, mom. And then uh, Never Die by Rob J. Hayes. I loved Never Die. Have you read that one? I have not. Oh, I have you not. might like that. It's like a darker, darker toned one. Um, yeah, I, I think I actually have it on my TBR yeah. as well as Michael Fletcher. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm yes, I, I definitely want to check that. I'm a, I'm a grim dark person. Yeah. I like grim dark. Um, what was Michael Fletcher's book? I think I might have that one. I'm looking at uh, that one. I can't remember. I know there's a lot of people. Obsidian Path. Oh, um, okay, yeah, yeah, a ton yeah. of people love his stuff. Yeah, and he's he's done a couple of different things, and I hear that he like gets pretty out there uh, with with some of the stuff that he does, and I'm always for that. Like. You know, sort of Kaigen took a lot of chances. I like that a combat code took a weird, you know, the concept and, and I thought it was cool. Like combat codes for people wondering. Uh, so imagine in the future, instead of losing millions of people to large world wars, it was settled in single combat. Like this person represented this and this, and there's like they have like teams. I mean, it, it's very interesting. It has a sports feel a little bit to it. Too. Yeah, don't spoil it too much. I'm gonna read it eventually. Zach Redolf oh, really yeah. loved them. I just haven't gotten around to it. I think you'll have a lot of fun. And as someone that does jujitsu, I will say that the actual content in there, it's like a jujitsu seminar. Like it's, it's very good. It's, it's accurate. Oh yeah. He's a black belt. Alexander Darwin's a beast. So oh, uh, nice. Yeah. So like you're getting like actually well-written hand to hand combat, which no one writes very well. So. And I think the other thing about self-published too is like, yeah, if you have a niche like that you like, you can find so much more in the self-published. Like, I know one thing that does really well in self-published is lit RPG. Like, cause there's a yeah. whole group of fantasy who loves lit RPG and you can find so much of it. Now I'm not really a lit RPG person, so I haven't read any of it, but like, that is kind of like a fun. Yeah. But I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to definitely be reading more, more this year. Yeah. Is there any like that, that are coming down the pipe or ones that you've had your on for a long time that you're excited about? Yeah. Um, I mean, two of them, I forget the titles of <laughs> because I got them a couple months ago. So I feel bad. I can't even like pimp them out, but, um, the, the book that I chose as a semi-finalist, um, A Handful of Souls, um, that sequel should be coming out sometime. And I'm very excited to read that because I really liked that book. I obviously chose it as my semi-finalist. Yeah. Um, so I want to read that. I really want to read the sequel to Never Die. That for sure. That's Pawn's Gambit. So I'm going to read that this year. That cover's um, sweet. I saw that cover for Pawn's Gambit. covers are so cool. So good. I just, I love them. And the content, well, I mean, I don't know about Pawn's Gambit, but Never Die, I just like really enjoyed um, I'm going to get to the combat codes. I want to do that. Um, I want to read of Honey and Wildfire. I don't know if you guys have heard that one. That was a finalist maybe last year or two years ago. I'm really interested in getting into that one. I heard that's like a really unique book. So um, yeah, there's a lot of them that I yeah. uh, want to get into. Yeah, I think, uh, and I, I like what uh, Chris says here. So the best part of self pub is how uh, liberating it is <laughs> for both it. authors and readings. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, can write anything and find any niche. Yeah. And actually the one that I'm going to read next uh, whenever I can get to it is Seasons Album by Chris Warman and Elon Marsh. Uh, I've heard a lot of good things about that one. I, I've only heard good things and I hear it's really atmospheric and I'm a big atmospheric reader. There's yeah. the one. That's it. I mean, I could grab it off the shelf, but it's behind me. Um, yeah, I think liberate those. Liberate those. Um, <laughs> the other fun thing is just like you get to actually have relationships with the authors. So like, if you read a self-publish and you really love it, it's like, really fun to like champion them like you just like you finding a band yes they blow up. <laughs> yes that's exactly what it's like so it's like oh i get to champion you now and be like you're amazing and like you get to talk to them and like that's really fun yeah and i think i do think that we're moving into an uh, a kind of a new phase of publishing where yes i mean daniel green would be a good example of having a backing Right. And being mm -hmm. able to do self-publish and maybe that is a better deal than a traditionally published like intro. Deal. Sure. So in, in a lot of ways that that's a path forward, I think. And Sanderson is an ex a, the best example because he's engaging his fans. He is a traditionally published author, but look at the community that he's creating. He's creating cool. content. Uh, Christopher Rocchio in the Sun Eater series does this now, gives writing updates on YouTube. And 
people are becoming very loyal when, whenever they read his books. They also happen to be really good. I, I, I think yeah, you kind of need both of it, but for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going to get away too far. Um, or you're not going to get too far if you don't have the chops to back it up, I think. But it's just interesting that I think that there's going to be legitimate alternatives to the big five or the big four or whatever it is now uh, in going your own way, building your own path and your own platform and uh, publishing that way while also having a more intimate uh, relationship with your reading base. I think that's really, really cool. Yeah, I mean, that's really just the internet, right? The internet's doing that yeah. for so many things, film, TV, news, music, yeah. news. Like, it's just, um, I was... I don't I mean, I'm not like a huge thing in music, but there are some people I follow in music and they were talking about how like really like these huge number one albums, like all these sales is really just kind of going away because things like Spotify and Apple Music and all these things have diversified music. You can find any music at any time. You're not yep, listening to just what the right. radios are telling you to, which is kind of now trickling down to like books, like self-publishing is on the rise. Mm -hmm. And with Kindle Unlimited, you can just read as much self-published as you want because um, a lot of people yeah. do that. And so it's just, it's a very interesting shift in dynamic. It is. And I think the only concern I have, and I don't know anything about this, but I've seen this, I've seen this just talked about with multiple artists of Spotify is like, how many plays do you get to make a dollar? Right? Like oh, that's a big, yes. so I do worry, especially with a huge conglomerate like Amazon, if, if, if the way is to go to Kendall Unlimited, like how is compensation being worked out? I hope that, you know, the people who are creating this art are getting rewarded for it. Oh, um, and they're not. I mean, that's, <laughs> I don't, I don't I, yeah. think they are. <laughs> I kind of feel felt that way, but I, I don't know for a fact, but I I mean, like I guess I true. don't either, but I just feel like that's always the case. I mean, but I mean, that's been the case since the dawn of time, it feels like. Like people used to always complain about record labels um, and yeah. now it's Spotify. Like I just never think artists usually get the money that they deserve for their art, <laughs> but that's a yeah. whole other conversation. Well, and you know, it's interesting that you, and I think this is why, um, the fun, the indie fantasy fund that you guys have set up is actually really important. And it, it's a good thing to do because uh, just like music, a lot of times an artist will sign to a label because they want to spend the label's money, right? Like mm -hmm. that is a big thing. Uh, they don't want to spend their own money on photo shoot, all these things, uh, music right. videos and such, right? So the exact same thing happens with authors. Authors will sign with, um, with Orbit or Tor and then they get you your artist and you do these things. Uh, and so there is that cost of spending your own money to continue to your vision. And the fact that you guys have this fund set up, I think is pretty instrumental in motivating people to get their well, art out there. It's also about understanding that, um, things like editing is paid work. Yep. Like so many people are like, well, you, I could just find a free editor. And it's like, well, editing is an actual job and you need to pay yep. someone for that. And if you want good editing, you need to pay someone a decent amount. Um, same with art. Like, um, I'm on a Reddit thread or a Reddit subreddit, uh, new tubers, which is all about new YouTubers and gives advice and stuff. And one thing that always drives me crazy is people will say things like you should never pay someone for art. Like you can just do it yourself on Photoshop, like never pay someone for your banner art or anything no. like that. And I'm like, I mean, I'm so unartistic. So maybe that's why I know this, but like so. art is, <laughs> art is like an intense skill that they had to develop for years of practice. They have to have a lot of equipment to do digital art. That's expensive tablets and Photoshop and whatever coloring things. Like they deserve to be paid for their work. And I am a little biased because I got an artist for my uh, like intro and stuff and I love it. Yeah. And like I paid her and it was worth every penny because can you imagine what I would have put together? It wouldn't look like that. And so just like this idea that like editing and art doesn't cost money it's like no people deserve to get paid for the work i don't you know because you're a developer yeah. so like people try yeah. to get free developing all the time right <sighs> let me tell you what if i have one more person <laughs> tell me they have an app idea and then oh. oh, and then i go what is it and then they go you got to sign an nda and i'm like you're a moron zach constantly oh, constantly right. Gets, I have, and the worst part is they're like from my friends too. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> oh yeah, family like, members. This is everybody. Man. And like, you know, I have a one of my closest friends is a photographer. Same thing. Yep. People just think you get photography for free. And it just, nothing bothers me more than like somehow people think these aren't things that deserve payment. So like, I think that's, that's the other thing. Uh, it's like also encouraging like to pay people what they're worth, but also helping you get, you know, quality yeah. stuff. I like what Star said so you're too. So you're not paying the artist yes. for the picture of the movie file. You're paying the artist for the time they put into developing their art skill and also the yes. time spent. And the um, time spent. Yeah. And I there's mean, expertise. 
there's so much to that. And, you know, if they say do your own art, it's like, okay, well, write your own books. Why would you ever read anyone <laughs> else's book? <laughs> yeah. Well, when people say, do I look, I did my own art just on Canva and I go look and I'm like, yeah. And I can tell that you did your own art on Canva. Like, Woo-hoo, yeah. I, let's go. I mean, I've never said that, but you can tell. Like, I don't think fine, anyone too. thinks I did my art because it's really, I mean, I'm obsessed with the artwork that I pay that person to do. Um, but it's just like, you can usually tell when it's a professional versus a not professional or someone who at least has some art training. Now, if you're an artist and you're doing YouTube, obviously do your own stuff. I'm not like saying something like that, but like you can tell. Yeah. As actors here, people always want you to do your stuff for free. It's good. Yeah. I, let me tell you what, whenever I started out wrestling, I I used to drive to Tennessee and I would wrestle in the stadium in, in uh, downtown Nashville, which was nothing more than a heroin den. And, uh, (laughs) And I used to drive eight hours and I would wrestle, get beat up for five minutes. And when I would come time to pay, the guy would hand me, we always said a hot dog and a handshake, you know, Ugh. and you, I didn't know if you guys knew this, but hot dogs do not uh, put fuel in a car. You can't stick a hot dog in your gas tank. <laughs> um, and I didn't make enough money in, in those early days to, to do, to stay. So I'd either sleep in my car, or I'd drive back. So it'd be like a 16 hour trip. I would make nothing. And everyone said, Oh, but it's good experience. You're on. I was on like, and back, this is like 2010. Right. So local access TV was still kind of a thing. And they're like, yeah, but you're, you know, you're getting into this many households and blah, 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 blah. You know? And I, I'm like 19. I'm like, yeah, doesn't, exposure doesn't pay the bills. No. And you know what? You know how many people watched me on <laughs> Southern access cable? Not many. And Not just many. to clear it up for the comments. First of yeah. all, I do all my own thumbnails and my thumbnails suck Alan. So like, I'm not dunking your thumbnails. You have the best. I am obsessed with your thumbnails, but also I'm not saying it's bad to do your own thing. I'm only saying it's bad. If you act like you are as good as a professional artist. Yeah. She's talking about degrading the professional work. Yes. It's about, yes. It's about that. Like, I don't, obviously like there's tons of stuff I do myself that doesn't look good. Cause it's not, I don't have the funds to do it, but I don't like people saying it's never worth paying an artist. Like, and degrading that as if, 10 years of skill is the yeah. same as you going and learning Canva for 10 minutes. That's the only thing that bothers me, not doing it yourself. Like, I think there's plenty yeah. of people who've done their own intros that look good, but don't tell me that it was like, well, I'm just as good as a professional. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the unfortunate thing is there are people out there who will charge for uh, even cover art on books and such. And, and then they don't do a um, good job. A good job. Um, no. Speaking of cover art, you've never read Tad Williams, right? I don't think so. Okay. Well, Memory Song and Thorn is very near and dear to my heart. I love okay, Tad. I, th- I think he is a pillar in the genre. I think he's an author's author. I love Tad. Okay. Just so we can get that clear. Okay, good. So he published. Is there a so- butt coming? <laughs> well, I'm, a- I'm angry. I'm oh, mad. okay. Oh, okay, I'm, okay. I'm mad because <laughs> DAW has published Tad. Tad has been very successful for them. Uh, uh, Memory Song and Thorn, especially internationally, is a huge hit. Um, he wrote those many years ago and he created a sequel trilogy that is now a quartet because the book was too long. Hmm. So they split them. The first two books of the last King of Ostenard have Michael Whalen as the cover artist, just like the original memory star and thorn trilogy DAW. And which is penguin random house is not hiring Whalen to do the last two books. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it is awful and i mean no disrespect to that cover artist i'm sure they're a wonderful person and have wonderful pets and all types of things but they're not michael whalen i was gonna say the problem is if you have michael whalen so yeah and and imagine being tad tad and tad's you know i i follow his wife on uh twitter she's very kind uh she is not happy about this either and imagine being locked into a contract you know we're kind of talking about self-pub and but at least with self-pub i know that it costs a ton of money and you are limited by the funds but at least you do have the opportunity Control. to have continuity, hopefully, uh, and the opportunity to do that. Like, I feel bad for Tat because everything that was re- they announced, like the release of the I mean, book. I feel bad for you, to be honest. I feel bad for me I if one of the book I loved. Yeah, I would feel bad for me. I'm so angry. I'm so <laughs> um, angry. Yeah, it's very interesting how little control. I didn't really know how little control uh, published authors had over their cover art yep. um, until two things. One, I did a huge Wheel of Time cover art deep dive um, and found out that like... <laughs> Robert Jordan <laughs> just did not love his cover art. Um, and then really, uh, I didn't know that. Oh yeah. He shades it so much. I love the wheel time. Co- I know they're cheesy, but I love them. <laughs> oh yeah. He shades them quite a bit. He likes some of them. Um, yeah, he was shady about it, but also there's um, kind of well-known the indie publishing sphere. Some of the books that were indie published and then went on to get traditionally published. People vastly preferred their indie published covers 
One very famous example of this is The Great Bastards. I don't know if you've read that by Jonathan no, French. but I've, I've had it recommended to me a bunch. Yeah, um, the in my opinion, the self-published cover that he chose, you know, as an author was superior to the one that now that he's traditionally published got chosen. So I think that's so interesting. Wow. I know uh, Senlin um, and Josiah Bancroft kept his that he had. And I think it's his buddy that did the covers for all the books of Apple. And I thought mm. that was really cool that that was like kind of part of the deal. Like he got traditionally published. He's like, but I want to keep this artist and they, and they kept it on. So that's really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Alan says, by the way, Hillary, I guess I should break it to you that Whalen is out for SA five. I was actually hired and I've got some MS paint mock-ups. You know, you. Alan though, um, I feel like you can make an iconic cover. I've seen your thumbnails. I've seen your Photoshop, you know, it would be iconic in a different way. I mean, <laughs> I, I did not enjoy gray bastards, but I think most people did. So I would recommend it to people who like that sort of stuff. Yeah. It's on my Patreon wheel. Uh, like people put like random things and I pick one a month and people, uh, people have been putting it on there. I think it's RJ. Um, they're pretty high on it. I'd, I'd like to give that a, uh, a shot. Yeah. I mean, people love it. So like, I have, I think it's just like the right person sort of book. Yeah. I would never claim it's like objectively bad. Just like, wasn't really my taste. That's kind of, uh, how Senlin ended up for me. It was just really, not really high. taste. Yeah, like I don't have any gripes. Like, in, and that's why I didn't really post a review. It's you probably really... shouldn't say that with Alan in the chat. Oh, I know, I know. He's, <laughs> he's very. Nice. I mean, I, I just point a lot of people. I know, like my friend Chase, uh, Evie's a big fan, I believe, as well. Like a lot of people really enjoy those books, and I totally, I totally see why. Like Josiah Berenkoff's definitely talented. If he writes something else, which I, he is, I will definitely check it out. But for some reason, I don't know just why. Don't I just care. didn't. I disappoint people all the time, Jimmy. It's fine. You can join the club. <laughs> I think uh, I think I disappoint people more probably than I uh, fulfill their their Me wishes. Um, of course, see when then when Leanna agrees with me, I'm like maybe I'm wrong, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I thought we already agreed that um, Leanna doesn't like books though, so you can always count on her to agree to not like a book with you. Yes, at least at least we stand uh, we stand proud. Um, how do you feel? Like you know, there's a lot of things that you've done with these polls. Uh, you, you have this amazing wheel of time adaptation kind of narrative going on in your channel through videos and videos and videos. But how do you feel about being the sole piece of Alan's Jeopardy buzzer resetting? Like, do you feel like <laughs> this, that is my new identity is as the Alan reset the buzzer. I will never live it down. There's someone in every Jeopardy who comments. Is Hillary here to tell you to reset the, bu the buzzer? <laughs> Every, I have been on all the Jeopardy, every Jeopardy someone talks about it. And it's like, here's the thing. It's just so indicative of my entire life. Like I've always been the bossy type A, let's do it the right way sort of person. And so now that it's getting out on YouTube that I'm that way, it's like, great. Now everyone knows the truth, <laughs> you know, about who I am. And I'm the buzzer girl. That's, that's what it is. You're the buzzer girl. <laughs> you don't yeah. look thrilled. I, well, I mean, it's just, it's like, I get it. Like, that's who I am. And I just wanted to hide it from the internet a little longer. I wanted to be cool, you know, <laughs> and I'm not. And now everyone knows. Oh, man. Uh, that's, that's, that's tremendous. <laughs> you know what? Truthfully, Alan, I cannot come back on Jeopardy because I didn't sleep for like two days before Jeopardy because I was so nervous. I made a study really? guide. Everyone knows. I made a 12 page study guide to go on Jeopardy. But, but why? Why were you so nervous? Because it was like the perfect storm of everything I fear most. Like the fear of looking stupid and the okay. unpredictable. I don't like unpredictable things. I'm a planner. Hmm. Everything's planned. And I also don't like looking stupid. So like what is more unpredictable and the opportunity to look stupid than Jeopardy? And so I'm having my husband quiz me. And he literally looked at me and said, you know, this is supposed to be fun. Like people go on, like, this is a fun thing and you're making it such a not fun thing. But then I did have fun. It was great. Once I was on there, I answered the first question, right? So I knew I got something right. And then it was fine, but it was a very stressful experience for me. So do you feel like when, like when you're doing content, and whatnot, are live streams way more like, is this stressful? This isn't stressful because I don't feel like we had anything specific we needed to like touch on. So right. like, this is fine. Just like chatting. I've, I mean, my first live show I ever did, like I broke out in hives after, but now that I've Man. done it several times, I'm okay with the live shows because 
there's not like a ton of ways I'm going to necessarily look stupid. I mean, I have said stupid things and then like thought about it for like weeks afterwards. Oh, but for yeah. the most part, it's okay. <laughs> oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Alicia. Yeah, that's very kind. She said, uh, we need more visible type A women. You are a role model. I would agree. That's oh, wonderful. That's very kind. I am and very I type A. And Alan says, Jeopardy could not exist without you as the buzzer reminder. Everyone has followed your example. You know, you always do have one buzzer person per thing now because of me. And you know what? I, I like that. Thank you. Everyone's being nice now. I'm actually not that insecure about it. It's like I've been there <laughs> my whole life. So at this point, I've accepted it. But um, yeah, I'm. this is fine. Yeah, I'm not really scared anymore. It's especially because we've done lives before and we've chatted. Like I'm definitely more scared with new people. Um, yeah. I have a lot of social anxiety. So like having to ask people to come on lives is very stressful, but you've already said yes. So it's fine. Now we're fine. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Reaching out is always like kind of, cause like it's hard because I, I like, you know, obviously I like collaborating. This is like what I do. This is kind of what I'm known for now, but it's one of those things where the initial reach out is very difficult because I kind of feel like I'm being a stickler because I'm like, okay, it's seven 30. It's, you know, I, I do have a structure that I do keep. <laughs> Uh, and yes. that's to keep myself in check more so than my guests. Um, and also, I do think that like consistency is really important in anything in life. And if you go look at my channel, all my thumbnails are consistent. They're not great, but they're they're consistent. All my reviews mm -hmm. look the same. My chime and nuts look the same. And that's because that's just who I am as a person. I keep things kind of. This is in why order. we get along, Jimmy. That's you think? I am. That's where <laughs> yeah. we meet. That's our that's middle. That's where we meet in the middle. I think life's I mean, pointless. My... You my don't. videos come out on Wednesday every day at the exact same time, every week at the same time. You, you're a nihilist. I'm an optimist, but we've met yeah, over consistency. Over <laughs> order. That, that is so important. Organization. Um, yeah, I will say I don't post on the same day every week because of how much I uh, do. I feel like if I if I say I have to post on Sunday, then I start to feel uh, like a arbitrary pressure. And then you also post more though. So I feel like it matters less if you post. post yeah. I keep more. accidentally posting a lot. Like it's one of those things like I've always said, <laughs> Oh, just one video a week. And I'm like, I posted four times this week. Like that I was like, you post a lot. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't the plan. Uh, and, and another thing about what kind of what I do is I do, I obviously have my book reviews, but like a lot of my content's long form. Uh, mm -hmm. and it, it didn't, wasn't supposed to ever be this, but it kind of became that. You, um, you know, that's interesting. You should talk about that. Like when you, I think people think you start YouTube and know your voice, but you kind of discover your voice on YouTube as you go. Don't you feel that way? Oh yeah. Like, I, I mean, I had a purpose for my channel uh, and I abandoned my mission statement like day two uh, <laughs> because I just didn't, and I didn't have enough confidence to be honest, uh, to, mm -hmm. to kind of go out there and, and do what I wanted to do. But the whole idea was to try to find the next, a song of ice and fire for myself. That was the whole oh, plan. Okay. Uh, so my first video on the channel is me screaming and it's just like my chin and big forehead. And it's like <laughs> me just being like, the books are good. Forget the show, dude. <laughs> and, and it's just, it's a mess. It's <laughs> Yeah, and, everyone's and, first video is a disaster. Well, the second one was worse, and it's because Shake here, uh, Sheik here is uh, telling me that uh, that a Game of Thrones four stars. So I gave Game of Thrones four stars because I was trying to be like a critic. I was trying to be a critic, and uh, <laughs> it's a five star book for me. Like it's literally like one of my favorite books of all time. But I was like, well, I better give it a four because I'm going to give Clash a four point five, and then I'll give a Storm of Swords five. Uh, okay, this <laughs> you know, and and uh, I started. I just thought about it too much. And I think it all started to click when I started thinking about it less uh, and, and saying, what do I want to do? You know, one of the things I really wanted to do was talk to people. I like conversations. I don't have a ton of friends. Uh, you know, I moved later in life. Uh, it becomes very hard to make friends because I, I, I have no friends, Jimmy. Uh, only my internet friends at this point. Yeah. Like we this moved, is, we moved during a pandemic. What are you supposed to do? I have no friends. Yeah. I, <laughs> when you move and you're past age 25, there's not much you can do folks. Nope. Like I, I don't go to the bars. Um, you know, I, I try to talk to people in bookstores. They look at me funny. So I just gave up on that. Uh, jujitsu, you know, I'm, you know, we're choking each other to death. You can only be so close. I mean, come on, uh, you know, and then so this is kind of my social life. So I was like, well, let's go out here and like, let's make, let's make some friends. You know? Uh, yeah, and, and that's what happened. Yeah. I actually didn't expect to make friends and I've made a ton of friends, which has been a total godsend for me since we did move in the middle of COVID and it's still just things aren't really back to normal where we are. And so yeah. Alan, you are my friend. That's my point. You guys are my only real friends. The people I've met through booktube um, <laughs> that I talk to every day. You guys are all my friends. <laughs> um, yeah. It's like, so, and it's interesting because like you said, like 
all my friends, like real life friends, I don't know, whatever it's humans I see in person. Yeah. Um, or I guess they're in different places, but people I knew from the before times, um, none of them really like read a ton. Uh, and so it was so interesting to just meet a ton of people who had such the same interests I had since I haven't really had that before. Uh, so it's been interesting. Yeah. And I think especially like with how crazy everything's been in the last, I don't, I don't know, six years, <laughs> it feels like it's been forever that things have been crazy in the world. Having a scope to your conversation around books and entertainment is actually like better it's than really ever. Mean. It's better than ever. <laughs> um, yes. And it, it's made me see things from other people's perspective. It's been very important. And I do, I do believe this guys, I'm a little biased, so forgive me, but I do feel like us here, all 97 of you watching and and, you know, me and Bookborn here, I feel like we uh, we're better at talking things through for the most part. I, I feel like the crowd that is attracted to books are my people for the most part. <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, I would say especially like the people who are really active in the community. So yes. like people who are booktubers or bookstagrammers or um, people who are really active on Discord or whatever, like they are some of the most fun people to disagree with because we yeah. all don't take it very seriously. We all are just talking about what we love. And it's like, that's my kind of thing. I mean, you do get those fringe people. We were talking before we went live about your dabbles into manga and my wheel of time. And you get just like the scum of the earth sometimes, but mostly <laughs> you don't. Yes. I've, I've, I've met people who are so thoughtful. Um, and, and also like, I like our, the content that our like little corner of the internet makes. Like we were talking about this before, but like, we're so small. <laughs> Nothing nothing and yeah. uh but i think the content that goes in like i do really and i mean it when i say i think that you make some of the most thoughtful content because you pull your audience you talk to people like you're not coming out and saying i'm book born and i am the objective truth no and it's funny you say that because i guess i said i didn't think i was going to make friends but i did come on to have conversations like the whole yeah. um my whole idea actually for a book blog was like five years ago so like five years before i started my channel I wanted to have a book blog just because I had no one in my real life to talk things over with like and that was my point so when I got on YouTube my whole point was like I just want to talk to people about this like discuss with me please because nobody in my real life other than my husband has read the books I've read and at some point he's like I'm done discussing this with you like at some <laughs> point you like you you get to an end where they're like I don't need to talk about this anymore and so on the internet you never run out of people who want to talk to you about it which has been really fun yeah, I, I think that the convers the ongoing conversation too, in the in the evolving of those relationships and also the like the way we perceive books in media. Yes. Like I always tell people if I would have read Realm of the Elderlings a year early, I would have hated it. Hmm. Confirmed. Absolutely. And I, and I think I would have been that way about the first lot too. Like I first of all would have never read it, first of all. And then yeah. probably would have felt differently. And so it's interesting, like my yeah, I've expanded so much through talking with other people about yeah. books which has been fun um spot center here uh saying no jimmy told me, uh many stories to me my family friends and crowds of people i'm a big fan uh that that's uh that's one of my old wrestling for uh fans Aww. thank you man uh that's been awesome with you the whole time yeah uh it always uh it always um yeah it touches me whenever i see people say that because uh oh man like a lot of uh thank you spot center thank you uh that's cool Hmm. Yeah, you, you know, you think back about a, a something you spend a lot of your time on, and uh, whenever you have someone pop up and tells you that it meant something, it's uh, uh, pretty impactful. It's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, even now, I mean, I've barely been doing this. I've been doing it for like a year and a half. I'm still shocked that people watch and thoughtfully interact with my content. It surprises me every time. Every time I post a video and there's like regulars who have been there since the beginning and want to talk to me, I'm like, why? I'm so grateful that you want to, but like, it still shocks me. Uh, it still shocks me. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but like, were you shy when you were younger or like, you know, cause you said you grew up a nerd. So like, like, where did you fit in? It's like hard. I always, I, I'm like a socially anxious extrovert. So I went through this period where I was actually very <laughs> outspoken as a kid, but mm -hmm. then my outspokenness became something to be like made fun of. I felt started getting very socially aware all of a sudden and then I got really anxious about how I was perceived. So then I pulled back a lot. Um, and so I think it's been more like a push and pull in my life about being too loud or too quiet. And so I don't know. I don't really know how to answer that. 
Yeah. I, 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 you said like the social anxiety, but being outspoken, I totally understand what you mean. Like that was me. I kind of talked to everyone, but I felt like I fit in nowhere. Yeah. Um, so being, uh, in a very welcoming community like this and having a ton of people around me and people actually being interested in what I have to say is very odd, but, but it's nice. It, it really is. Um, we were yeah, talking I think it's, before. um, oh, sorry. I was just going to make one okay. comment about yeah. how, like, I went through growing up having to feel like I was embarrassed for my like hmm. hobbies, mm -hmm. like some of my friends or the people I dated would poke fun at my love of fantasy and poke fun that I went to journalism camp. Yes. I went to journalism camp. I was the editor in chief of my journal high school newspaper and I got teased for it relentlessly. I liked that stuff. Okay. And so then it was a process of like, I don't know if you feel this way, Jimmy, but at some point, and I specifically think in my thirties, you're like, I just don't care what anyone thinks anymore about what I like. And Listen. it's really weird. You just wake up and you're like, I don't care if you think it's weird. I like it. Yeah, because you realize that no one has any like no one knows what they're doing. Uh, yeah. Spoiler alert. You know, I, I kept hitting echelons when I grew up um, and I always said, oh, this person like once you get here, they know what they're doing. Oh, here they'll know what they're doing. And I remember doing my first WWE tryout and being like, this is gonna be so much better than the independent wrestling scene. Oh my and I went and it was a it was a mess. And I said, Oh, these guys don't have they're this is a billion no dollar idea. company <laughs> and they have no idea what they're doing. And then like you move up in a company or you get a higher position. You know, I switched uh fields, like I went from sales to uh kind of like a supervisor in retail, then I did IT and then I went into coding. And each time I said, Oh, you know, these are the smart, they know what they're doing. No. Nobody no. knows. No, I was so terrified when I first started my coding job that like all the seniors would just be so smart and they think I'm so dumb. I show my senior stuff all the time and he shows me, you know, it's, it's a two way street. And that's the same thing when it comes to talking about books, creating content. I started and I was so nervous. I said, you know, I'm never going to be as good as a Daniel Green or whoever the big people were at the time. Um you know, but I guess there was a piece of me that thought maybe I could do it because I did watch them. And I said, oh, like, if you know, if they can do it, I can do it kind of thing. But then you turn on the camera oh, gosh. and it's it's a whole different thing. What made you finally like get in front of the camera? Well, that's an interesting story. I'm sorry. It's a little long. Be OK with that. <laughs> I think we have time. <laughs> okay. We have time. Um, so when I don't know, like sometime in 2016. 15, end of 2015, early 2016, I decided I really wanted to start a book blog because I had so many book thoughts. And so I bought a domain name. I coded up a whole website thing. And then I would make blog posts just on my computer, but it never felt right to publish them. I was like, I don't have time right now to do social media. I don't have time. So I did that for like four years. And then finally, and I was like, well, I had a kid and then I was working with a kid. And then I did this big volunteer thing. And then I had another kid and it was just like, there was never time. So finally in 2019, I was like, well, either I'm going to do it or I'm not. So I was like, I am going to start my book blog. And so I sit down to do some Googling and it's like, blogs are dead. You can't start a <laughs> blog in 2019. Nobody will read it. And so it was like, you have to do YouTube. And that was super uncomfortable for me because my blog was going to be anonymous. I wasn't even going to show my face. And yeah. now this idea of YouTube was going to be the exact opposite. All of a sudden I'd have to be like a persona. And I just, I even still don't think I necessarily have the personality to be a persona. That was very scary to me. Hmm. Um, and so my husband really is the one who, he bought me a camera because I hate when we buy things and don't use it. And he's like, I'm, I bought you a camera. So now you have to use it. It's like, you have to do it. <laughs> um, and so I did. And that is literally how it happened. I was like, I guess I'm going to try it out. And my first video, I think I ended up filming it like five times. <laughs> that first video. And it's still garbage. Just no one go watch it. Like, I stand behind the content of it, but it was, it's so bad in terms of like hey, delivery and editing. You're going to see a view spike on that video after oh, today. Just so it's you know. like, oh my gosh. Um, and, and I just, I was surprised I did. I did not tell anyone though. When I say I did not tell anyone in my real life, nobody knew about my YouTube channel until maybe like a year in. Like I hid it from everyone and how long have you been doing it now two years no a year and a half year and a half It'll were you two years in june were you class of 2020 then i am class of 2020 the class of 2020 you're strong. class of 22 aren't you class of 2020 i'm class of 2020 yeah we, we we're all great you alan, <laughs> alan alex <Andy>. yeah <laughs> strong class 
yeah. some would say the best. Um, I think maybe Megan reading revelations too. Okay. Yep. Uh, when did yeah. Leanna start her channel? Was she class 2020? I, she might have been 2019. If Leanna's still on, she can tell us. Um, yeah, my husband's saying that my parents found it. Like, I'm not kidding. I hit it so long. Finally, Zach was like, you cannot hide this from your parents anymore. Like, this is so stupid. You have to tell them that you have a YouTube channel. Um, I'm just, I was really embarrassed. It just sounded so embarrassing to be like, well, I started a YouTube channel. Something sounded so self-important about that. And it wasn't yeah. about... You know what I mean? Like I know I was exactly like, what you mean. <laughs> it's like, I'm not starting a YouTube channel because I feel like I am better than people or self-important. I'm starting because I literally just want to talk to people about the stuff I love. Yeah. The only um, difference between us and the people watching now or that will comment later is that we just turned on a camera. Like, that's we the just, difference. We decided to turn on a camera. That's and it. so, um, yeah, it is funny, though, because a lot of people did it because of the pandemic. But mine, like, I started back in 20. Like, I had the idea for a really long time. It just happened that my first video went out during the pandemic. Yeah. Maybe you had a little extra time, just a smidge. But um, you have you have kids, so you put on yeah, free time. It was kind of like extra time, but also like I was emotional disaster because I was with my kids twenty four seven all of a sudden, and like no school, no anything. Mm -hmm. Um, so not a great time. But I, yeah. I, it, but I will say it became even more important for me to do it because I needed something for myself even more, like mm -hmm. that I was doing just for me, nobody else, for no reason than just because I wanted to. Yeah, uh, do it. Yeah, I felt like so I started reading and I was I was enjoying booktube and, and it was helping me get motivated to read. Can I tell you a secret? I had never yeah. watched a single booktube video before I started my booktube. That is incredible. <laughs> now you can continue. No, that's incredible. So uh, how did you even figure out what format you would do? What I did it. First video? I'm going to watch your first video. <laughs> my first video was called Are Brandon Sanderson's Female Characters Any Good? Are they? They're, I love them. Eh. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, and um, uh, I did it. I didn't know what I was doing. I just was basically making video essays like a blog post. And I still do a lot of video essays. That's what I want to do. But I do think there was one advantage because I had never seen BookTube. I didn't have any expectations of what BookTube was supposed to be. So that is a small advantage, I think. I just did what I wanted to do. And now I've learned and now I've watched BookTube and now I'm better because I have watched better people. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, anyway. I think I think that that's actually really cool. I mean, the, you can never be accused of copying anyone's style. Like it's it was literally all you. And I mean, maybe you could accuse me now because I've watched people, but like. <laughs> well, through osmosis. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, I've seen since I've done Chad with Nuts, a lot of people have started opening up. Like they, they realize that, you know, long form conversation is something people really want. Um and oh, please here, don't put this on. Here's I really your don't. first I, video. I please, I don't want to see it. It's like <laughs> the camera angle's so bad. Like, I'm not I even like looking it. at the camera. It's just the whole thing is so bad. And I I memorized the whole thing, which I don't. Um, so oh, I script all you had my a script? videos. Well, I Still. Script all, I script all my videos. Still? Yeah. Um, but script, not, I never memorize anything. But I write out fully all of my thoughts because it helps me organize myself. And then I just talk and occasionally refer to my notes. So I feel like there was a point I missed. And then I just edit out the pauses. Okay. But that Very video, I memorized a script and just delivered it without ever checking notes or editing. So if that tells you what a pain that video is going to be to watch, that's a thing. Huh. I, I, I do bullet points and then I kind of just roll and we see. And some days I got it and some days I do not. <laughs> I would never have it. I just, um, I feel like I'm more eloquent when I have really thought about the order of my thought, like where I want, I said I was a planner. Exactly. <laughs> I shouldn't um, be surprised. That's like how I have chapters. Like I know what my chapters are going to be before I do my video because I've ordered my wow. thoughts in chapters. I think in chapters, like how am I going to organize this so someone could come and see it? Um, oh, gosh, my husband is so embarrassing. He just says stuff like this to people all the time. He's always hyping me up. I realize that's a great quality to have in a spouse, but it's like very embarrassing for me. Yeah, well, the, being, you know, having a supporting spouse is pretty huge. Uh, he's, he's, can... a, he's my hype person. He's really Absolutely. my hype person. That's amazing. <laughs> is your is your wife supportive? Oh, yes. Uh, always pushing. I mean, she helps me set up every single time. Um, you know, I did the 5K celebration, finally had her on a stream, which was really nice. And uh, but she's always been a driving force. Even like I remember like I I was battling because I told you I'm like a very consistent person. Um, like I was definitely like fighting depression a bit and, uh, I couldn't seem to get myself to do, I wanted to, I, I wanted to make videos and I was reading, um, 
And I just like couldn't get myself to do it. And if it hadn't been for her, I probably wouldn't have like, came, I don't even want to say come back. I was just sporadic with my uploads. Um, but because of her, you know, pushing me and being like, do it on your time, like do when you're ready and that kind of thing really helped me out a lot. Um, and I think that without her, I wouldn't be doing half of the things that I've done uh, here on the channel. Like I told her, like, I want to do like chatting with nuts. Like oh, I have this podcast. She's like, just do it. And, you know, I'm like, but what if no one shows up? And she's just like, who cares? And she's like, do with someone that you're friends with it. You know, you know, it's always those things. It's the words of reaffirmation and anything that I, that I'm, I want to try. Cause I try everything in life. Like I'm a doer when it comes to things uh, like with, for instance, wrestling, like I saw pro wrestling. I said, that's cool. I'm going to do it. Uh, I saw jujitsu. I said, okay, I'm going to do it. I, I just, I do a lot of things. I admire that. Uh, I'm not afraid to fail. That's the one thing I take it hard when I fail. Uh, I remember when I, when I was trying to learn how to code coming home, uh, from interviews, I failed, I failed the whiteboarding portion and just like being mm -hmm. in tears thinking I'm too stupid to do this. Um, and she was always there, always there for the pick me up and, and the pushback. And, uh, you know, and she sees like kind of how Zach's saying, he sees all the work you put in. I know she does. Uh, cause sometimes it takes away from our time, like doing those molasses discussions, folks, those are three hours Gosh. and I work at least three hours on my notes. Like it is. I'm so you would have to with miles. On. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, 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 I know that it means so much to a lot of my viewers that I want to make sure that I do my due diligence. Um, mm -hmm. and, and people said, you know, J Jimmy, you know, you, you read that those so fast. Part of the reason is because I was in it and I didn't want to get out of it because <laughs> I was just like, I'm laser focused on this. Um, so yeah, uh, Kelsey has been more than supportive. Uh, and that's with everything in my life. She saw me like when I was at the top of wrestling and she saw me, on my fall down. <laughs> so she, how she's long have been you guys there. been together? Um, going on eight years and we've been oh, married. Okay. We'll time. be married for three. Um, but we've already felt married before. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it, it, it was semantics at that point. We just wanted to get everybody <laughs> together for a, uh, for a, uh, a little get together. But, um, star said, Jimmy, did you get your wife some books? I did. I did. And she's gotten more <laughs> books since, and she's on uh, Royal assassin right now in Farseer and she's loving it. So I, I want to ask you about that thing though. That's interesting. Like you don't, you aren't afraid to fail. I, that is something I am very impressed by because I'm the opposite. I don't want to do something unless I think I'm going to be decent at it. Cause I hate failing. So I'm just impressed. I wish I had more of that. Well, I take it hard. Kind of I take it hard when I fail. I'm very hard okay, on myself. I would too. <laughs> uh, and, and uh, this is, this is like a weird thing to say about, yourself but like i'm a quitter uh like i will i will get so frustrated when i fail that i'll quit and that's generally when i know if i'm in on something because i'll come back mm -hmm. uh like i i'm pretty good at knowing when something's not for me like i'll give it a go and then i'm and like, like oh, yeah, it's not for me not for me not for me uh like i boxed for about a year and uh while i was having some success in it i noticed very quickly that it wasn't for me and then mm -hmm. i i quit which is a good that's Sometimes, a good habit to have. Yes. You need to know when to walk away. <laughs> Sometimes being a quitter is a good thing, folks. Sometimes it is. Uh, but I will say when I started BookTube from the first video, even though it wasn't good, I knew that like I liked it. And mm -hmm. I knew that the, I, I got like commenters that were just so thoughtful immediately, which I know you said you you had <laughs> the top. Well, no, I did. It was no, no, it was I, I that was an exaggeration. Like the first video, I had so many people discussing stuff with me. It was like my dream come true. Uh, yeah. So I felt the same way there. Yeah, it was like, wow, people like listen to my opinion. And sometimes I was like way off on stuff. And, and I just thought that was a, uh, uh, a great thing. And it's, it was a dialogue I wanted to continue to mm -hmm. do. Um, Darren, thank you for the five spot. He says, this is an amazing example. I feather can make you stronger. You know, anything, uh, never learn anything when you win all the time. It's true. And none of us win all the time, um, which we were kind of talking about how much we hate social media, <laughs> um, which, you know, I, I think the, you know, there, there is some obviously good merit to it and stuff, but yeah. uh, a lot of times the social media, we only see people winning. They only post the wins, yes. which, um, you know, in fairness, I have some thoughts about this because I have thoughts about everything. Let's go. I do. I do feel like because this happens a lot um, in the parenting sphere, like you never post the bad days with your kids. It's like, well, like it's not hmm. because people are trying to and not me personally. People just say right, that in right. general, but it's like it's not like necessarily people are trying to deceive you. It's just that like usually when you're having a terrible day, you don't want someone to take a picture of you and then post like even in the <laughs> old days, like you're not like that's it's not purposely deceptive. Like a lot of the times it's just that when people are enjoying themselves and having fun, that often feels like the thing you want to share, share. with people or Happiness. record because you are happy. Now, I mean, I obviously think that gets turned 
to the negative quite a bit or people who have to document everything. Yeah. Um, you know, I always say the thing, like, sometimes I'm just like, our kid did that funny thing and we didn't film it. Like, that's okay. Like, we just yeah. have the memory. You know yeah. what I mean? It, it's and fine. Yeah. It's fine. And, I, and I'm big on not filming everything. But um, so I do think some people overreact, like, that it's so negative that people are sharing, like, a highlight reel because, like, mm -hmm. it's not... I don't think it's malicious a lot, I guess is the right word. No, I think, I think there's certainly people out there who are just trying to put positive into the world, but then there's also people who, um, are influencing for whatever, yes. you know? Yes. It's, it's you, a give and take. Do you think we're influencers? Oh, I shouldn't be, but I guess. <laughs> why not? Why, 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 why shouldn't you be? It's too much pressure. Like when people are like, I'm reading this book because you told me it was good. I'm always like, uh oh, <laughs> like I know that's the point. But like, uh oh, <laughs> do you not feel that way? Do you like it? <laughs> uh, well, I, I do my best to certify that I am a moron. Uh, okay. that I, try, I try to get that out there. I've had a lot of concussions, uh, a lot of brain trauma, <laughs> and I'm just trying to put the words one after the other, folks. Um, yeah. And I think, actually, I'd love chat. Like, do you feel like booktubers? You influence me, Jimmy. <laughs> uh, but Shandell says, I would say you guys are influencers uh, because I think there's like a negative connotation when it comes to the yes. word influencers. I do think like when people find out you're talking about books, they do have a different opinion. Like no one's heard me that I'm like talking about books and been like, oh, that's it just has a different connotation than people maybe who are displaying like their bodies for like fitness or like yeah, very definitely. forward things since ours, uh, I guess people consider like intellectual. So I do think there's like a little less of a pushback. Like I haven't had a lot of people be like, Oh, what you do is pointless. Um, but I mean, I know some, some friends have said that their family does think that about booktube. So I don't know, maybe it depends. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely, I don't know. I guess it depends on the word influence and what an influencer is. I think in our sphere, what we are trying to do is build either excitement or conversation around literature of specifically in this realm, fantasy and sci-fi. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that in, in that regard, I'm fine with that. If you're telling me I'm influencing you to read more and to engage with people, I'm down. I have so many people in my patron discord that say, hey, I'm not a very social person. This is me stepping out of my zone because I just enjoy the way that you talk to people. And when people say that, it means the world to me. Oh, so it if, means the world for sure. Yeah, if that is what the influencing that we're doing is, then I'm down. But if it were to say that I'm trying to push an author or, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. then that's wherever I'd be like, I don't want to be a part of that crowd, obviously. So, yeah, I think that's what it is. Like, I get stressed if like people think I have to like, stand for one certain thing or like one type but yeah if you want to be like i'm influencing you to read fantasy in general i'll take that i'll like mm -hmm. that um but i mean i will say since i started booktube um thank you it's okay i had my husband bring me water because I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like just getting really thirsty You're like oh. thank you zach for the alley-oop <laughs> um i think that um i oh some people in my um like regular life like until i started booktube like some people told me wow, I, I knew you read, but I didn't know you read like that much. Yeah. And a lot of my friends have started reading because I read. Not necessarily like some of them aren't really necessarily fantasy people, but like that was really meaningful to me to have people be like so invested. Like, well, I guess I should start reading if you love to read. And now they're like reading, going from reading nothing a year to reading 20 it's, books a year. Yes, That's insane. It's, it's a valid option to use your time for and, and to be yes. entertained by it. Yes. Um, and, and it's kind of on the rise, like reading numbers are going up. In fact, physical books numbers are going way up in sales, which is very interesting. I think that there is some novelty to that. Yes. Um, that people really enjoy. Uh, KJ, the dude says, well, before I found your channel, I didn't read an actual book since high school. Uh, usually a manga reader only, but you influenced me 100% to get an actual books. That is awesome. I take that uh, very seriously. And thank you very much. Yeah. And I think part of it can be too, as um mostly fantasy booktubers also was like my friends realizing like, Hey, reading is more than just what I read in high school, more than just this, like having yeah. to be this deep, like reading can just be enjoyable. I can just read yeah. books that I like to read. And that I think is also something people sometimes don't realize. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's one of the reasons actually in Bishandel also says that he says, as an example, I would say shadow of the gods would have sold way, way less without booktube. Mm -hmm. And I have seen people criticize the fact that shadow of the gods got too much hype on booktube and it's overhyped and blah, 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 blah. And what I would say to that is 
do you believe like obviously there's a conversation we have for like how good something is that's mm -hmm. fine like that's a discussion you can have and subjective taste will vary that whatever however um when i hear that it always makes me a little bit sad because uh you know john gwynn or any of these other authors um they're not making a killing folks. Like it's, it's not like John Gwynn is like, if I go, if, if I say rhythm of war is overrated and I think that Brandon Sanderson, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Like it, Brandon Sanderson's going to be okay. folks. Like he's going to be all right. Or like, um, you know, now that game of Thrones has a TV show, like, George R. R. Martin is going to be just fine. George is going to be fine, guys. He's he's building a moat around his house in like San and wherever he is, at Santa Fe. Sanderson he's, is building a dungeon. They're all yeah, building. Yeah, they're weird. Up. Let's 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 first and foremost, these, these guys are weird. All right. We love them, but they're we weird. We love them, but they're <laughs> we're they're weird. All weird. It's fine. We're, we're weird. weird. We're very weird. I can't uh, say I wouldn't do any of that if I didn't have the. I cannot oh, promise. Oh. Absolutely. I would definitely have a moat. I would. I mean, I would have a Zach uh, and I have always dreamed of having a secret entrance to something like behind a bookshelf. <laughs> like we both like we, like this was something we talked about like when we met like de like a decade ago. And if we had the funds, like that would be the thing we would build is like the pull the bookcase, you know, secret. Yeah, that would be amazing. Uh, yeah, I always think about things like that and where can I put more bookcases. Um, so we, I mean, we all have our own flavor of weird, but Sorry, the only thing, continue. yeah, but the only thing that kind of, uh, <clears throat> it bums me out whenever I see, cause it, I think it's fair to say I'm tired of seeing John Gwynn. I read the John Gwynn book. I don't understand what the fuss is. That's a valid opinion. And I'm not saying it's bad, uh, but, um, it's like the, the need to maybe quiet down that talk that bothers me a little bit. Um, just because it's like, you know, these authors that we are influencing, because we, I, I enjoyed that book a ton, right? So I talked about it a ton and I told people to read it because I, I thought it was fun. That was really good. Um, you know, that probably did boost something. If I had a little bump in the, in the scale of sales, I would say. And, and that's a great thing because these authors are trying to make their way to becoming a Sanderson or, mm -hmm. or a George R. R. Martin. Um, so for them to keep writing and that, you know, they're putting their passion, it'd be different if someone was just putting out you know, trash every six months. And, you know, yeah. I was pushing it. That'd be a lot different. So, um, yeah. And also there's a, there's a thing like, it's okay to like things. Like, I know that's funny coming from me because there's a lot of things I don't like, but I always say in all those videos, it does not bother me if you love this. Like that is great because yeah. I like things other people don't like too all the time. Like yeah. I've been hyping up Nevo a lot and a lot of people have read her because of me and did not like it. And that's okay. But I, yeah. it's also okay that I liked her. So, you know, I think that's, and I think most people get that. There's just like the small, loud minority that feel like you said that they have to like tear down, you know, a yeah. success or whatever. And, and to be clear, I think that like not liking it is a totally valid opinion. Mm. And I, I don't mind. I don't mind hearing that. No, I know what you meant. I know yeah. what you meant. But, uh, you know, it, it's more like the like we got to stop people from talking about this thing. It's like, come on, like give the author their money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like it'll be OK. It's not the worst thing in the world. I promise. Like, especially whenever the person happens to be super kind. Yeah. Um, and, and, and also we're in our own little niche on the Internet. Uh, we, we don't matter as much as what well, we were talking <laughs> about that because I was just saying like, um the biggest book tubers out there, especially fantasy book tubers, like in the drop of YouTube are nothing. Like I follow people on YouTube who have like 10 million, million. followers. Um, yeah. And so, you know, there's really, if you're doing book tube, it's not for the fame because no. <laughs> you're just never going to get there. It's because you love books, you know, it's really yeah. the only option, <laughs> which is kind of fun, which is cool. Like yeah. it's cool about our, our little corner of the internet. Yeah, we kind of know each other and, and it, it's fun. It, it, feel, it feels like a, like a really close-knit community in that regard. Yes. How do you feel? Because um, you've obviously had success on, on the platform. How do you feel about your channel growing? I mean, I like it. Yeah. I won't lie. I'm a very goal-oriented person, mm -hmm. um, very like driven person. Um, and so I set goals for myself and I want to achieve it. And growing an audience was a goal I had, um, not to make money. Like, because I barely put any ads on my videos. I do one at the beginning and none mid-roll because I really, and I have never taken a sponsorship because I just don't care. But I do want it to make a community that yeah. talked about stuff. And a part of a community is growing that community. Um, and so I've been excited about that. It has changed. Like, I just, I recently went up a lot uh, after we yeah. time. Um, I had like a 50%. Or I mean, a hundred percent subscriber increase in the last wow. two months. 
Um, and that was really exciting, but it also has changed the dynamic a little bit mm -hmm. where like before I was responding to every comment and felt like I knew everybody on my channel who was commenting all of a sudden that's changed. And I'm not necessarily necessarily sure. Like I love that because yeah. I like like the 20 people that used to always come to my <laughs> videos and talk to me because I felt like I knew them. And I mean, I still talk to them on Instagram and everything. So it's been kind of interesting now. Like, well, I can't respond to every comment. Like I just, I literally can't on some of these real time videos. It's just like too much. Yeah. And I don't love that because my whole point was that I wanted to talk to people. Yeah. Um, so it's like a give and take, but I am, yeah, I'm, I'll admit it. Like people act like it's shameful to want to grow, but I'm not, I want to, and I'll admit it on the internet. Like I enjoy growing. Yeah, no, I don't think there's anything wrong with growth. I think the interesting thing has been for me hitting five and then like in a week hitting 6,000. I was going to say you had five and I was like, but like in no time you were immediately, you're like six, five now. Yeah. And I'm like, well, this is going quickly, uh, you know, and, it, and, it, and you're right. It changes. Yeah. Um, and it, it's one of those things where it's like, OK, this video I made, I thought I'd be talking to a few hundred people. And then maybe yes. one day it's 20,000 or 40,000. Yes. And you're like, oh, God, um, yes. so I do feel like a slight bit of pressure. Yes. Um, and, and these videos do very well. Like a lot of people enjoy what we do here. And, and I think that's awesome. Um, but for some reason, when I do these. I don't feel any pressure. No, I'm not feeling pressure. It's because it's <sighs> not. It was like when you do your models on videos and like one of my first videos to make it big was my Cosmere video, all the Cosmere mentions um, that got like 30,000 views. And when you're doing something like models on or or Sanderson like that or real time, all of a sudden you have fans who know a lot and they expect you to know as much as they do. And that mm -hmm. can get stressful. Like, especially like, I haven't really read models on. I'm going to start it. But like that's a fandom that definitely expects you to know a lot. So I can see how you might feel pressured to like, yeah, know enough. I, I will say this though. Um, my experience uh, with not knowing everything. Cause like I would come on live streams and I'll be like, all right, folks, this is the stuff I got. And this is stuff I don't understand. And I was shocked and very pleased with how, uh, forgiving a lot of people were in those live chats and they were able to correct me in real time, which has a mental effect on me as the content creator, because I I'm sure you've had this happen. You'll get a detail wrong in a video and you'll get a thousand comments. And by like the, the hundredth one, you're like, I know I mispronounced the name, I but, know. In, but in live, you can fix it off one comment. Cause you put on yes. the screen. Oh, Hey, I mispronounced this word. I thank you so much. And then everyone knows. You're and on the same up. page because, and, and it's nothing against the commenters because they don't read the other comments. Oh, of course. And it's nothing, but it's very grating to read it yes. 100 times. Yes. <laughs> and, and if there's, I'm the king of bad pronunciations on You're YouTube. the king? I'm oh, the queen yeah. of bad pronunciations on YouTube. Well, we'll I'm roll. like, no, for now. <laughs> we rule this land. People have like said like my pronunciations are upsetting. Like people yeah, yeah. That in the comments. Uh, I actually got a compliment <laughs> on my last Berserk video I posted last night. And the guy said, you actually pronounced Wild's name correctly. And I'm so impressed because you've been so bad. He's like, honestly, congratulations. I'm really surprised that you got it right. <laughs> well, this is good. Have you noticed that there's like a nice way to tell people that they're not pronouncing things right and a really <laughs> rude way? Have you gotten both of those? Yes. Because yes. Yes. some people are so nice about it. And it makes you like, oh, thanks. And some people are so rude. You're like, I'm going to keep mispronouncing this just to spite you at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I changed my pronunciation of Malaz in like eight times. Been, and funny thing is, Erickson doesn't even care. <laughs> Does anyone know? I always said Malazin. And I'm like, I don't think that's right. It's like I don't molasses. Know. So the la. So Mal it's Malazin. Malazin. Like, Malazin. Okay. Malazin. Yeah. Like if you're in Louisiana. <laughs> Malazin. Yeah. We're going to get some of that Malazin. Um, but yeah, it is it, the other interesting thing about growing. I wonder if you've had this too, is like, because I had a lot of like dedicated viewers, like they knew the stuff I read and stuff. Yeah. It's Jasna. I will never say Yasna. And I am on record that Yasna is incorrect. <laughs> it is Jasna. And that is the only right way to say it. And uh, Sanderson backs me up, by the way. Sanderson says you can pronounce it whatever way you want. So anyway, uh, uh, it was really funny because on one of my Wheel of Time videos, someone was like, Hey, have you ever thought about reading the Stormlight Archive? You should check out Brandon Sanderson. And it was just so weird to have someone be like, you should check out Brandon Sanderson when like my channel name is literally off of Mistborn. Well, um, yeah, I've had that. I've had that happen to me quite a few times. Yeah. And it feels weird, not because I think people should know me, but when you've had for a little bit only watchers who watch your stuff, 
it feels really weird when that changes. And so that's been like an interesting thing. Like it's yeah. cool. It's like, wow, cool. Like I'm growing, but it is, it's just like a different feeling. Do you, do you feel like the things that you cover and you do on your channel are going to change now that, that you've seen the increase? Like, no. do you want to make different types of content? No, because I don't enjoy making content. I don't enjoy <laughs> like, that's, well, that's the fair. only way I can say it. Like, um, there's a lot of content I know I could make that would get me a lot of views, but I'm uninterested in making the content. So I don't. Yeah. And I know that will probably hurt me a little bit because I'm sure a lot of my Wheel of Time viewers want a ton of Wheel of Time content, but I'm kind of like getting bored of it. So like, I just, I only want to talk about something I have something new to talk about. So like right now, I feel like I'm kind of like at the end of that interest for me, you know? And so, no, the one thing I do want to do though is like, people did like watching these differences videos and I love that stuff. So I may do like famous adaptations and start rereading their books and then doing differences videos. I would love that. I, I think it would be fun. Um, I really want to do like princess bride because a lot of people just haven't read princess bride and it's a fabulous book. And I think people would be interested in knowing like the differences between and the adaptation is amazing. So it wouldn't be like with bad adaptations. It'd be like good adaptations, but like, still just kind of knowing the difference, you know, like Lord of the Rings, like there's so many good ones. So I think that is the one takeaway probably from my will of time stuff. Yeah. I, well, I think a lot of people are interested. In it. I know I am. Uh, and we talked a little bit about this on Instagram, but it, it's interesting that the wheel of time has had a lot of backlash for the changes that, that they mm -hmm. made, but a show like shadow and bone has a ton of changes. I mean, they completely almost changed the narrative to fit, uh, you know, more than just one subset of books. What do you think about the changes drives fan reaction? Like what do you, like, do you have any hand on that pulse at all? You know, I'm trying to figure it out. It's something I'm very interested in. And I've actually, you know, I read an entire thesis about adaptations um, hmm. that someone had put out. <clears throat> I made a little, a light video on it. Um, yeah. Someone did their uh, uh, PhD thesis or dissertation on fans' relationships to adaptations. It was fascinating. It was like 300 pages, but it was so interesting. Um, and that taught me a lot. And um, some of the things I learned from there, I think it's a lot about fan perception, um, first of all. And so things like Leigh Bardugo was super involved in Shadow and Bone and Six of Crows. Yeah. So I think her fans who were involved with her and she said like, look, I've been involved. I love this vision then they want to be on board with her vision as well. Now, something yeah. with Wheel of Time, that is impossible because Robert Jordan has passed away. But right. also people felt like the, he, they weren't listening to Brandon Sanderson, who was kind of a Robert Jordan step in because he finished Wheel of, of Time. Course. Yeah, And so I think that's part of it. Not always. Um, you know, they claimed Rafe was a big fan of Wheel of Time. That's not helping him right now. Uh, with the book fans, people are pretty mad. Um, and then I think the other thing is like, if you create something good, even if fans are mad about it at first, if it is good enough that people who didn't read the book love it, book fans are probably going to come around. And yeah. I've noticed that in things like I'd heard that people were upset at the beginning of Lord of the Rings. They left out Tom Bombadil and all this stuff. But objectively, well, I guess you can't say anything objectively, but most people love the Lord of the Rings films. They I are, mean, they're, they're amazing work of art. You know what yeah. I mean? Yes. And um, eventually book readers have to understand like what Peter Jackson did was a work of art and it it kept the spirit of the books. And so I think you do get some naysayers coming around, which is why I focused so much on non-book readers on my channel recently with Wheel of Time, yes. because I actually think they have more to tell us about the success of the Wheel of Time adaptation than book fans do. And what do you think the consensus is among non-book readers outside of our circle here? Our circle, um, that it was only okay. Like that's really? what I'm getting, that like, they're not mad about it, but they're also, it's not exciting people like that first uh, season of Game of Thrones did. Like everyone yeah. was talking about that first season of Game of Thrones. That's someone who hasn't watched it. Like you could not go anywhere without someone yeah. talking about Game of Thrones. It was and annoying. It was annoying. It was. Like, everyone was talking about it constantly. And like, that's the ironic thing. Like I know so much about the Game of Thrones TV show by osmosis because I could not survive in this world without knowing about things like the Red Wedding. And like, like right. you just, you can't. And um, that's just not happening with Wheel of Time. Everyone is telling me like, hey, yeah, it was a fine fantasy show. Like I was entertained, but that's it. They're not, 
they're not telling people you got to watch this. You won't believe the ending. You know what I mean? Yeah. My gut feeling was that it was a lot more positive than a lot of the diehard book fans. Um, Completely. Yeah. I thought it was a lot more positive. So I'm, I'm a little interested that you said it was just okay. Like, I feel like that's interesting because, um, and in a lot of ways, it seems like it was successful because you hear always oh, the most streamed show on Amazon. It was the biggest new show of 2021. But then I start thinking back. I go, well, what new shows came out in 2020? <laughs> like, it, it's a weird time in entertainment. It beat Squid because, Games. See, that's what I'm saying. Like, you see these headlines, and you're like, how did it beat Squid? I mean, Squid Game was streamed in in I mean millions. Of I people's mean, homes. like insanely insane amounts. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, so that's what so Radiant Reads is saying six out of 10. It was just funny because I interviewed three different non book readers that I knew and they all gave it a six out of 10 independently. I did them all separately, really. Yes, um, and so that was really funny to me. I think what happened is episode eight. Did you watch it? Uh, so I watched the first three or four and I okay. was out. I was, out. um, so episode eight, pretty much book fans and non book fans alike all agreed was bad, and I think that's what hurt it with non book readers is that like. On these kind of seasons, you need to end on something pretty big. So people yeah. have a motivation to start season two or tell people like, oh my gosh, you have to watch Wheel of Time because the episode eight was insane. And because that episode failed, it hurt the rest of the show. Even the stuff that was good. Because I, as a book fan, was... I mean, people told me I was shilling for Amazon because I apparently was too kind to the show, even though my title of my review was The Wheel of Time was disappointing. But I was I was nicer than a lot of book fans. I understand that things have to change, so that didn't bother me a ton. But the sloppiness, I think, is, is evident to non-book readers, and I think that's what's hurting it right now. Hmm. Radiant Reed says, which was more chaotic end of book one or of season one? Because I'm I'm actually struggling to remember the I mean, I remember the end of either world the beats, but I don't remember feeling like I remember wanting to dive into book two because I knew it was a 14 book series. Yeah. But like if, if it was a book one and like the next book had been coming out, I don't know if I would have jumped like been like, ah, when's book two come? Yeah. And and gosh, I hope there's not any like intense Wheel of Time fans on here. because They're going to get me in trouble. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Wheel of Time, okay. but like we all most normal fans recognize that the eye of the world like isn't the strength of the wheel of time. Yeah. And so I think most fans were expecting them to change things probably for the better to introduce this to new audiences. And I think yeah. that's more the problems that they failed to do that. Interesting. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I, I think some book fans are getting angry because Rafe is showing very little care that book fans are unhappy. He's, doing the opposite like book fans say they don't like it so i want to do it more which is just like an interest interesting attitude attitude yeah benjamin said his non re a uh, non-fantasy and, and and honestly when i and think people have loved it i and people yeah. and some non-readers have loved it i've just noticed no one's hated i've never really met a non-reader who hated it like the readers are they just i think a lot of them are just feeling like a lot of them have been comparing it like, well, it didn't excite me as much as Game of Thrones or something like that. I loved Eye of the World. I mean, I read all 14 books after I read Eye of the World. So like, I'm a huge Wheel of Time fan, but I think compared to the other books, it's not, you know. Yeah. I, and I'm someone who actually didn't like the Wheel of Time, but I actually like the first two books a lot. The Great like Hunt, I think is amazing. I really loved The Great I Hunt. I love The Great Hunt. Yeah. Um, uh, then after like that, the after that, it kind of fell off the wagon for me, but um, I, I think, I think you're right though. I think ending a season one on, on a higher note, uh, Man, that, that was a missed opportunity. Yeah, and even for me, because like I, I had some problems, but after episode seven, I actually really liked episode seven. And I was like ready to forgive everything. I was like, oh mm. man, they're going a good place. And I think a lot of people were in that spot. Like, yeah. I'm ready to forgive it all because they're just like ending it well. And then they just, they just missed. And I think that's, that's hurting it, so. Yeah, and I'll be honest, even uh, bigger for me, um, is the fact that we have to think about even when we say non-readers, not just non wheel of time. I mean, people who do not read people watching mass singer like every Tuesday. That's the person I want to know because that is well, not with super... somebody I interviewed. Uh, yeah. So like, that's a good sample yeah. in my opinion. I always go off of my in-laws and my non-reading friends yes. and I, I listen to what they tell me. Uh, and I say, okay, that's probably more in the center of the discussion. That's yes. probably like a more mid-level take. Um, yeah. The guy, uh, people at work that I know that watch Wheel of Time, uh, were actually they were like, no, dude, you're wrong. Like, this show's good. Uh, and these are people who don't read at all. <laughs> at all. Uh, they love Game of Thrones the last few seasons and all that stuff, right? Um, 
they all again they don't have any concept of the book they told me after episode eight they said we're done whenever yeah i mean that's the thing that's the problem because if episode eight had worked for non-book readers then it wouldn't have mattered because if it works for a general audience that's literally all that matters and i I said that in my adaptation video i told people like this is going to suck to hear but they don't really care about book readers we're too small Like they need yeah. to do general audiences. And um, my best friend, she loves watching fantasy shows, but she's not a fantasy reader at all. So it's mm-hmm. again, she gives me the pulse. And it was kind of the same thing. Like, yeah, we were enjoying it. But episode eight, like nobody liked it. And that's going to kill it. Because I think if episode eight had worked really well for the kind of people you're describing, Jimmy, then I think I think it would have, you know, taken off more. Yes, I I agree with you. Um, And if and their complaints were nothing of, um, you know, they left this out. It was... They didn't like, uh, apparently they didn't like the, um, actual battle that happens, I guess. I don't want to What do you mean anybody. battle? Well, yeah. <laughs> like people, no battle to be seen. There was like, it didn't make any sense. <laughs> people were like standing there for like eight hours. And then like, they were saying that the, it actually looked bad. They get ran out of the budget almost or something. They said maybe Which, COVID. How? How? They had so much budget. What is the budget? Someone in chat looked this up. What was the budget? No, I know Shadow, what it is. For Shadow oh. and Bone. Oh, for Shadow and Bone. Oh, it's cheaper. I do actually know that too. I because did research Shadow for and that. Shadow and Bone looked Great. I think it's really hard to find show budgets. I think Shadow and Bone only had like two to three million per episode. Contrast to what? Uh, I might be wrong. It might have been six. Some maybe someone still got up. I did look it up at once. But I mean, still, Wheel of Time had eleven million per episode. Yeah, they it was like eighty to ninety million for the budget. Same as Witcher season two. <sighs> yeah, but like that is more. That's double the budget of Game of Thrones season one. And the problem is, I actually. I did a video that did very poorly because no one cares where I plotted budget versus uh, score. Um, like, does a higher budget make a better uh, adaptation? And it does not. Um, I plotted it and it doesn't. Um, and that's, I mean, that's obvious. I mean, it does sometimes. It's kind of one of those things like to a point. Um, well, it, it depends does, on the source material. Yeah, it depends on the source material because like I was saying, like one that's a an adaptation that's like a huge outlier is Princess Bride because it was made with like no budget and it's so well regarded. But there's also not really a lot of magic in Princess Bride. You don't really thank you, Alan. It's like so underperforming. It's one of my favorite videos I've ever made. So it's about data. <laughs> well, also, where does your money where does your money go? Yeah, and I think right. um there's I I was talking about actually it wasn't about Wheel of Time, it was because the budget had come out for the um the Lord of the Rings series. Yeah. It's like 300 million or something. <laughs> it's insane. And yeah. I was like, everyone's so excited. And I'm like, why? Since when has throwing money at a problem been the only thing that. That's the American like, way. <laughs> it, I mean, it is the American way, but it annoys me that everyone's like, wow, it has $300 million. Like that should mean something to me. Like, cause it means nothing. I don't think it means anything. Well, all right. So I don't know if I would say it doesn't mean anything. I think, I think for me, it, it means that I'm going to get a likely, I think it's more likely that you get a better looking show. Did you watch way. wheel of time? No one likes how it looked. It had 10 million per episode. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. But <laughs> if you don't know how to use it, <laughs> but, but 80 million versus 300 million. Oh, I, know. I feel like you can just <laughs> accidentally. Better. You can just accidentally take a hundred million and make something a dope. Like it's just going to accidentally come together for him. Um, I do like the fact that we saw practical effects in the, t- I know some people weren't hot on the teaser guy. It's a teaser. It doesn't matter. Like I got hyped because it's a teaser. I'm like, okay, cool. Show me the episodes. You know, um, if there's anything probably, and it's fun to get wrapped up in, but I, I hated the build up to the wheel of time with all the teasers and the over analyzation of all these. Things. And I, you know, I was guilty of it. You know, I chatted. I didn't them. watch a single teaser better that way i don't do it i don't care i don't want to know everyone who's like but this moment i'm like how do you know it's a two second clip like just everyone calm down everyone was freaking out about the two rivers and i was like can everyone take a collective breath for yes. heaven's sakes like just like whew. anyway so uh, i don't watch any of that stuff well i think you're better off that way uh one thing i want to point about game of thrones season one worked because of limitations i actually agree with you and one of the most awesome things and this isn't really a spoiler in season one instead of doing the battle from game of thrones that Tyrion is involved in they shortcut it by Tyrion getting knocked out and then he wakes up at the end of the battle because they didn't have the budget amazing change it didn't need to it didn't need to be in season one like it didn't even need to have it so that means all of the budget which was lower for season one clearly especially back in 2011 all of that budget then goes to costuming it goes to the actors it goes to the editing team so you're getting 
less money, but it's more direct. It's more focused instead of going out all and these I things. I think it takes skill to focus your budget though. Cause yes. see, that's why I think wheel of time yes. fail because it might, I mean, I love this can be controversial. I don't know. I love the casting. Like I think they yeah. just nailed yeah. it. Like I loved it so much. And so like, that was a good use of their money, but some of the things they did, I felt like were a bad use of their money. And so it definitely is like, um. Yeah, <laughs> I want to know where the money went. I'd love to see a breakdown. And maybe some of that has to do with Rafe because Rafe, I mean, his big claim to fame is he got eliminated on Survivor. I, <laughs> I didn't I, even I'm, know that. Oh, you didn't? <laughs> no. Dude, there's a video of him on the internet where he got eliminated and his head he gets dunked head first in the water and it's like dragging him and he's just eating water. Oh, it is so funny. I don't, I don't want to watch that. Sounds terrible. Oh, no. it was, it's so <laughs> funny. After season eight uh, or episode eight, my friend Matt from uh, Heroes of the Horn was like, this is how I feel about season eight. And it was just Rafe. <laughs> I um I only know because I did research on what he's done before because I was trying to find a connection between um what good adaptations <laughs> thanks Alex <laughs> uh, between good adaptations and what the uh, skill set of the adapter was the showrunner I was trying to see if there was any like these people had adapted a bunch uh, of stuff and that's why it was good I did a ton of research so really I couldn't find any um correlation to be honest um that's all the stuff that doesn't make it into a video. See, I did all that research. And I didn't even talk about it in my adaptation video. This is why I am not going to be a YouTuber because they're like, you should post more videos. And I'm like, I can't guys. It's just, I don't have the time. Um, but on, uh, YouTube tells you that does YouTube tell you that all the time? Like if you posted more, I don't look at my analytics very much. <laughs> like I just stay out. I don't either thing. anymore. Cause it's so obnoxious. It's like, leave me alone, YouTube. Um, but I, am. Um, what I did think was interesting, though, about Rafe is that he worked on a uh, Marvel show. Um, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., I thank think. Thank you, which yeah. I didn't watch. But so this is kind of like unfounded. But Marvel in general, YouTube is a bully, Alan. Um, Marvel in general, like, do they care that much about consistent world building in the Disney Disney version? I mean, like yeah. they just kind of there's superheroes that have existed and like why where were they during thanos that doesn't matter we're just gonna keep you know moving along here <laughs> moving along yeah and, and that's fine i think i mean i'm a fan of the marvel movies um not so much anymore but that's a whole other story but i watched all you know i watched all of the marvel movies uh pre end game um and i really enjoy them but it there there's a clear thing where it's different than a fantasy book where like yeah. the world building is usually a lot tighter and I do have this feeling that because he worked on a show whose like literally whole premise is bringing someone back to life that died in a movie, I feel like Rafe's perception of the importance of consistent world building is skewed mm. because I feel like in that type of show, it just matters a little less. The expectations are different in yeah. that sort of show. And I wonder if that contributed to some of the dropped um, details in the Wheel of Time where it is more noticeable. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. And, and that's a very Hollywood way of looking at things. So let me ask you this, because you're a Cosmere fan. Yes. And I talk all the time on here and in, in, in my personal life about the Cosmere being adapted because it is like the I mean, this is the high magic stuff that, that, that people talk about that is either hit or miss in the box office for sure or on television. So we all know that it's all connected, right? Stormlight's connected to miss. Yes. Uh, the, the, there's the Cosmere. <laughs> there's the Cosmere. I think a very big pitfall could be if, and, and I'm sure San Sanderson's obviously very involved with his work. So I think that we, we were probably okay, but if he has a studio make Mistborn and they make all these changes, which it sounds like Brandon's pretty cool with, uh, and they make all these changes and then we get a stormlight archive on showtime. I don't know. I'm saying showtime uh, on showtime and we get eight seasons of that. And the Cosmere connections that we see in the book don't cross over. How big of an impact does that have on a book reader that's watching a Brandon Sanderson adaptation? Because I personally think it's massive. Yeah, and I think it would be massive. The only reason I'm not super nervous about that is that Sanderson, um, and I think it was either his last uh, State of Sanderson or the year before, um, said that, like, he literally said, I have enough money now that I don't really care about someone buying my rights. So I'm not going to let them make my movie unless it's the way I want it to be made. Hmm. And so he said he's turned down a lot of people because they would not let him do what he wants to do for better or worse, because I do think sometimes maybe an author having too much, um, you know, is there, I'm going to agree a little bit with uh, fashion bell. Sorry yeah. if I said that wrong. Um, there could be a benefit 
currently where we are in the Cosmere of separating stuff in some ways, I think. But I think later on, that won't be the case. I think where the Cosmere is going, it is going to be so, in, um, so, so interconnected that it will be impossible, for example, to tell the Stormlight Archive without Mistborn knowledge at some point. You, you, know? really, you think that? Well, it's already sort of happening. Like with Rhythm of War, the Cosmere implications were pretty huge. And with, well, I can't tell you. There is a character. Uh, I can't say anymore. That's fine. No, there, no, it, there are hints. I'll just put it this way. There are hints to me that it is going to become with each successive book more and more and more connected. Yeah. Um, and, and so as of right now, though, you could pretty much separate them. And I don't think it would be that big of a deal. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. But I think in the future, it would become impossible. But we all don't know that yet. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I no, know. definitely. I, I, so that worries me a little bit because I, uh, Sanderson's like one of those authors that's kind of hit and miss with me. Like it just mm -hmm. depends. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's like that would, I, I'd be very disappointed if I go into the back five of Stormlight and I'm missing things and not, not missing the connections, but like actual pieces of the plot aren't as good for me. You know what I mean? Well, you've probably already missed things. Well, I've. We can talk about it after. <laughs> I, I, know, I, I know the connection so far because of Christian, and I haven't missed anything yet. Okay, okay. But okay, I'm um, and just start. I am not talking about Hoyt. I'm talking about somebody else. Yeah, and there's also uh, there's uh, implications from the interlude. Lost and Discovery is gonna have a video very soon that I think people will be very excited about. Yeah. Um, that shows some pretty crazy information that makes me want to read more of the Cosmere. I will say that. Uh, I, I feel like maybe Stormlight can motivate what, me to what read more. What have you read? What have you read? You read Mistborn and Stormlight? I've read Mistborn, Stormlight, Emperor's Soul, and I've read uh, Warbreaker. And How I do you thought, feel about Warbreaker and Emperor's War Soul? Uh, Emperor's Soul is probably my favorite Sanderson book. Uh, I so like excellent. War Warbreaker is a good book that could have been a little bit shorter, I thought. But it was good. Like, I had a good time with it. I, I'm not mad I read it. Uh, Mistborn book one was entertaining. I hated two and three. I, should, I, I hated two with a burning passion. Uh, three, I was apathetic by that point. Uh, I, I knew you didn't like have. Mistborn. Yeah. I, I hadn't heard about Warburg. War Everybody, yeah. Mistborn. Everyone in the chat's like, we know, Jimmy. We know. I, I know, folks. Uh, uh, well, but, it's okay. And Stormlight, speak I, his truth, Jimmy. You speak <laughs> your truth. <laughs> well, in Stormlight, I, I like quite a bit. Uh, Rhythm of War was not for me. I, I My opinion of Rhythm of War has soured the longer I've sat on it, but I'm curious to see what it's like in a reread. So yeah, I was burnt out rhythm of war. Gosh, all that science stuff, man. Yes. Just injected into my veins. I, would I, just I love about science. It all day. I love science, but for some reason it just, uh, but you didn't love it, fantasy science. I get it. Well, I, I think I was burnt out too. Cause I read, <laughs> mm -hmm. I read them all in like, Oh uh, yeah, that's, that's, and I, Warbreaker. I am um, read the stormlight archive. Um, when only the first two were out. So I've had three years mm. between each one. Um, yeah, which that makes sense. Changes it a little bit. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, Elantris, um, I think magic system is super underrated. I really love it. Um, but it is oh Zane. Where's Alan to do a Zane impression? Um, I do think that it is obvious that it's Sanderson's first book. I think that the narrative isn't as tight as his other narratives. So if you read Atlantris, just kind of think that is is what I always tell people about that. But yeah. um, otherwise you've read most of it, I guess only Mistborn era too. Um, yeah. I don't have any interest in continuing it. Well, the interesting, here's the interesting thing. So I am, I vastly prefer Mistborn era one to era two. Mm -hmm. um, they are extremely different. So there is a chance that you go into it liking it. I mean, I guess I don't know what you didn't like about Mistborn, but it's like, it's so different. Yeah, it, isn't it? Thing. Isn't it like Western almost or something? It's like or? a Western gunslinger. I love Westerns. Um, I like gunslingers. And I don't, which is probably why I didn't enjoy this. And it's like completely different. Like there are no Mistborn anymore. There are only people with like a single power because it's all been bred out. Oh. And so like even the magic's extremely different. So I, I do. Um... Oh, I'm teasing the back. <laughs> There's Alan being Zane. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, and a lot of people like air two a lot more than everyone. I just don't, cause it's not necessarily my thing, but like, and it's also in the beginning, a lot less of like a world scale conflict. Oh, um, in the first couple of books, it's more, in my opinion, more about the main characters kind of drama. So it's like, it's just like a different stakes. Now, of course it is Cosmere. So it eventually kind of gets to those stakes, but, um, 
it's different enough that I wouldn't say automatically you wouldn't like it. I mean, how about this? I'll give it a shot. I'll you give can it a try shot. it and just stop okay. reading it. You know, I'll still be your friend. All right. Thank, thank God. Thank God. I was worried. You seem so yeah. unreasonable. I drop a lot of people, you know, and they don't like the books I like. I just threaten to ban anybody in my server whenever they don't like the book <laughs> yes, I like. I mean, exactly. I'm kidding, but it is really fun to pretend like I'm going to do that. Uh, when, when you review a book, uh, because you do a lot of different types of videos, and this kind of brings me to my point, like whenever you don't like a book, do you find it easy usually to pinpoint what you didn't like about it? Because I've lately been having uh, like mixed reads, you know, like where I like some stuff. And then there's something overall that either makes me continue. Usually it's a series, right? So I either continue or I don't. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I, I sometimes have issues pinpointing what doesn't work for me. Like I know it works for me, but I'm still figuring out what like vibes don't work for me in books. Do you, do you feel like you have a good handle on it? No, I completely good. agree. I have no I, idea. Okay. Like it's, it, sometimes it's frustrating because I'll be like, I really liked this book and this book I really didn't like. And they have all like the same elements, but for some reason I liked this one and I didn't like that one. And I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, like I'm reading uh, Emperor's Blades right now, and it's a mixed experience. Uh, I'll probably finish it tomorrow or the next day. Um, but in, in a lot of regards, I think I've read a lot of books like it. Like not, it's it's unique in a lot of aspects, but I mean, just the what it is, right? It, it's mm -hmm. three POVs. Uh, they're going to be eventually coming together at some point, we know. Uh, and, and I'm like, man, I've read books that kind of feel like this, and I like those books. But this one, I have like there's like this underlying thing going on where I'm like, I can't put my finger on it, but like I don't love it. Yep. You know, and it's weird. Maybe I've changed as a reader. I mean, that's definitely possible. Well, and I also think like the crazy thing about reading is that sometimes you have to be in just the right stage of life, in just the right mood, having just the right experiences mood for is a book everything. to speak to you. Yes. And like sometimes, you know, you pick up a boot and you book and you're just like, I guess I just really wasn't in the mood for this right now. And maybe yeah. at another time I would like it. You just Mood is everything. Uh, if, for instance, uh, picking up uh, Legend by David Gemmel, I keep I'm in a mood right for like a worn down war veteran. That's what Legend's all about. So I pick it up and I'm loving it. And then I keep picking it up as a side read when I know I should just pick it up as my primary <laughs> read. Like I'm like I'll just read a couple pages every day. <laughs> and then I get out of the mood for a good old fashioned heroic fantasy. And then I'm like I don't want to read it, but it's really good. Like David Gemmel's <laughs> awesome. And I just can't finish this damn book. <laughs> it's 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 300 pages. <laughs> like, I know I just, what you mean. I read two Malazan books last month. <laughs> Why can I not read this 300 page book? What is wrong with me? It's driving I, me crazy. I know what you mean. I like I don't. It just it never makes sense. Reading is such a mood hobby, and which is why I don't make yeah. TBRs because. Yeah, you don't. I noticed that. You're like you're very very loose. No, nope, just a mood read. In fact, it's actually been hard because I've had a bunch of buddy reads, which is like stressful for me because it means I have to read something when I say I'm going to read it. <laughs> like, how do you feel about how do you feel about buddy reads? I mean, I like doing them. I don't do them a ton because I don't like to be tied down. Yeah. Um, but like, I well, I'm doing. I did a buddy read last month and this month with Liana, and buddy reading together is like so fun with Liana because we just like are so chaotic in how we feel about things. It's very loose, um, and I have been doing I'm doing all this year all the Hugo winners with someone um oh that's I cool. met through YouTube so we're doing all the Hugo winners and that's been really fun but I haven't liked very many of them so far so yeah yeah I mean I feel like buddy reads are fun but it's always disappointing whenever you're not sure if you want to continue like uh I'm like Ember's Blades is on the surface like I would say I'm in I'm not mad I, I'm reading it at mm -hmm. all right like I, I are would, you I, buddy reading it yeah, it's for Alan. Alan's oh, doing oh, Alan. oh, yeah, you told channel. me. You told me that. Okay. And it's like one of those things where I think if it wasn't in a read along, I would probably wait to pick up book two to a day where I thought about the book. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if, if it comes back to me and I'm thinking about it, I'll go pick it back up. Right. Um, unfortunately, uh, I feel like that's the case, but I want to continue because it it's a read along. So like I feel like this mm -hmm. weird like limbo because I like having conversations like it's fun, like seeing everyone Alan's server is you know, reading it and throwing out their opinions. And it's interesting because the opinions there are also like kind of mixed. Very, so at yeah. least I, at least I don't feel like I'm the lone duck that hates yeah. it or anything. And I don't hate it. I don't hate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then I wonder also if it's just my mood because I just finished a massive series in Malazan. I'm rereading my favorite series of all time. So it's like maybe that it's just like maybe it's bad timing. It's bad know? timing. Yeah. And I never have agreed to do a series yet. 
yeah. on Buddy Reed. That doesn't sound like something I want to do because I will never DNF a book, but I DNF series all the time. Like, yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit more uh, liberal with my DNFing, I think, just because I have so much stuff that I'm excited to read about. So I just it, can't do the DNF. I just can't do it. it I, I struggle with it because I'm a completionist and I like to give everything its fair shake, too, because I do yes. think the last hundred pages of a book can matter a lot. Yes. Um, Alan, I do not. I don't hate Emperor's Blades. I think I'm I'm sounding way more negative. I'm actually like mostly positive on the book. There's just a couple things about it that that have uh, kind of popped up. I get it, up. Jimmy. I give a lot of three stars. That's like three stars is my average rating to a book. Like, is it really? Yeah. I For checked. me, if, it, if it's like I would say four stars is my I don't really care, I guess, about my 3.5. I'd say I 3.5. So I'm tending a little bit higher. But, I think yeah. 3.5 is good. I wish Goodreads would just put it in there. Just give me the 3.5. So I'm not on Goodreads. Where are you at? I'm not anywhere. I'm on an Excel document <laughs> you're in to my say, computer. Yeah, you're supposed <laughs> to say I'm on Bookborn. I'm, I'm on Bookborn. <laughs> I'm, I actually did. I started Storygraph. And there are things about Storygraph. Have you heard of Storygraph? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, yeah, I kind of want to do a live stream of like showing myself setting it up because oh, i think it, a lot yeah because i i it the best thing about storygraph is it took my random excel document they like let me upload my excel <laughs> document that i've been keeping for years um, they said come here you savage give me your csd <laughs> yes, come Jesus. on um and so i did that and i do love a lot of things that they have like um you can say if you dnf'd a book which is like so simple and yeah. you can give 0.5s and you get to say when you start and end a book and if it's a reread like there's a lot of reader things on there um i have not updated it in like five months because that's the thing. I don't want to go on somewhere and have to tell it I read a book. So like, yeah, I don't give my fair. story graph to anyone. I just, I use my Excel document. It makes me happy. And nobody gets to know what I've read. I think, I'm a bad booktuber. I don't know what to tell you. No, no, I think that's <laughs> fine. I mean, th so the reason why I do like having a Goodreads, because most of the people who watch me follow me on Goodreads. And I like, because I don't always put a review off everything I read. One. I don't put a, me neither. Yeah. I mean, I just. I oh, can't. you know what? I have my Instagram. I guess that's. Yeah, your Instagram's Instagram is very much an update. Since I started, all it is is a picture of the book I read. I don't do any yeah. other updates. So like it's not searchable like a good reads, but it does have my last two years of reading. Yeah, uh, that, that's a good point. And it, it's a little bit more personable, too. And uh, then you don't have to use the crappy Goodreads mobile app, uh, which is oh, always a benefit. It's so bad. Well, I um, mean, Goodreads, I, I made a Goodreads account like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I and, you know, long before any of this. And I signed on once. And I got on and I was like, I hate everything about this. And then I put the back on. <laughs> I mean, I, I, so I use, technically have an account. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I use it. I don't say I would love it. Um, but I, I do also like because I will review maybe a book one and then not review anything else in the series. Right. Like Prince mm -hmm. of Nothing, for instance, I did book one. Now, I, I hope, by the way, any Prince of Nothing fans out there, I hope to do a stream with Mark from Slowly Read at some point. Um, but you know, I didn't review those books individually. So if people want to see it, they can kind of see my updates, I yeah. guess. Because I don't really post on social media. No, I think books. Goodreads is great, like, as a booktuber. Like, I think I should have one. I think people would enjoy that. But I just don't want to. See, this is yeah. my point. Like, I don't <laughs> want to, so I'm not. That's, it's just like, I don't know. I think that that's the best thing you can do. If you don't want to do something, don't do it. Just don't do it. Just um, don't The go. only problem is, like, there are some people who think I've only read the books, like, on my channel. And I barely review anything on my channel. Like, I'm not even like a review channel. I want no, to be like, really I not, yeah. I'm not really. Um, I only review a book if I feel like I have something very to particular say. to say about Best. it. So like, I'm not going to just go on and be like, I liked this book. But get, like, I did a review for Piranesi because I literally can't shut up about Piranesi. I, I, I did a review. Oh, so freaking good. So good. I did a review for Joe Abercrombie because it was my first Grimdark ever. So like, I felt like that was something I could talk about. Um, but yeah, and so that is funny to me. I want to be like, I've literally been reading fantasy since I was like six years old. So I have read a lot of books, even if you cannot see that I have yes. read them. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that you don't do like a ton of reviews. And it, and like, I, I agree with you. If I don't have something inter interesting to say to add to the conversation, I generally won't like put out a review for that book. Like I don't uh, review a ton. I mean, everyone knows I read a lot of Stephen King, but I don't read every Stephen King book I read because I don't. I mean, so many people read Stephen yes. King that I don't mm -hmm. know if I have anything. And honestly, King is like kind of I don't want to say guilty pleasure because like I'm not guilty about liking it. But like I, I like that I don't have to take notes when I read it. Mm. I just read it and I say you oh. should read like I do. I never take notes when I read. That's also probably why I don't review books. <laughs> so, well, fair enough. I mean, 
if I'm going to do a spoiler discussion, I, I take a, a extensive mm-hmm. notes. That makes uh, sense. If, if I know I'm just going to kind of cover the book, uh, I will, I will take bullet points. Uh, I've, tr- I did uh, for a long time, not take notes and I liked my videos less. So mm-hmm. I said, okay, uh, you know, and it's, it's a lot of, it has to do with just like bashing my head off chairs and stuff you know i mean Uh, the memory hard i do i will say i have a very good book memory i can really recall a lot about books that i like if i don't like a book then i can't i think for me it's like because i'm a reader first taking notes makes reading less fun and i'm not willing to make reading less fun for myself if that makes sense yeah no yeah and there have been times wherever i will just kind of uh throw my hands up where i just go if I'd miss something, I miss it. Like it is yeah. what it is. I guess I, I, enjoy it. I am the only book I took extensive notes during. Well, I took two. The second Witcher book I took extensive notes in because I had to give people receipts for why I thought it was sexist. And then my, um, I read The Way of Kings Prime. I don't know if you know about The Way of Kings yeah. Prime. Yeah. I read that to do an All the Differences video. Um, and that I had to take so many notes. In fact, I had three different note taking devices. <laughs> I was like, Damn. like, sticky noting and then i had two different notes on my phone app um and i hated it like i love that video i'm proud of it i'm glad i did it but it was just like not an experience i want to repeat yeah that's fair uh i think especially with the the level that i went with the malazan discussions i don't Mm. i don't know if there's a series i can do that for again like i really don't um also, Paul Johnson says, speaking of extensive notes, any plans on finishing the Cripple God? Yeah, I'm already done. Uh, I finished Malazan at the end of January, and we will be having a spoiler discussion maybe next week. I have to figure out what works for everyone. Um, and then I'll probably do like a Malazan series, no spoiler thoughts. Kind I'm going to have to go watch all of these once I finally get to Malazan. Make you me a promise. I said it wrong. <laughs> no, you can say it any way you want. That, that's, that's the beauty of it. If you... I read the first one a long time ago. You have to keep me in the loop if you're going to make, if you're going to do any discussion, any, please include me because I, I will. About it. Um, it's yeah, very well. near. You and can help me life. understand it. Because well, I don't the- know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about all that, but <sighs> thoughts on writing inside books. Should it be illegal? You uh, tell me, Jimmy. I don't care. Do what you want. Do. Yeah. Do what you I, want to. I know people who I think are tremendous uh, people that are good people uh smart and they write in their books so there's obviously something to it i personally don't do it uh yeah, that's either. because i'm kind of a, a neat freak with stuff and even if book even if it's a mass market paperback i treat it like it's a collector's because it's just how i was raised yeah, i'm in I, between I because so. i don't write well i wrote in my textbooks um in college because we all in engineering it was all open book tests so like writing in your textbooks was very useful but um i don't like to write in my books i don't like to dog ear them but i do like don't mind if a spine is cracked. Doesn't bother me at all. Yeah, spine cracking is fine. I, I will I say. I want to be comfortable when I read. Yeah, d- dog earring pages. Like my 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 wife does it uh, to her books. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I hand her like my farseer, you know, illustrated. I'm like, don't dog ear. <laughs> I, don't, don't, I don't like the dog earring. But I also like my bad habit is like I eat while I read. And so like <laughs> I do have food stains on some of my books. And like. <laughs> That's just a reality for me, uh, but never like a nice book, but like my mass market paperbacks. Yeah. I'm snacking while I'm reading. Okay. Like that's a fun activity for me. I will eat the popcorn or the Cheez-Its or whatever I'm eating. <laughs> that's so awesome. <laughs> and that yeah. grosses people out. My wife uh, also loves to snack as she eats, but she just also just snacks as she eats or snack as she reads. Snack as she reads. <laughs> Snack issues. A blanket, yeah. a snack, it's and like a People snack when they read, uh, when they watch movies. That's like a thing. So why can't I snack while I read my book? Hey, I'm not judging. I don't do it personally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You are judging Jimmy. Uh, just fine. a little bit. Just a tiny bit. <laughs> Jake says, uh, Jimmy, I've been commenting on Bookborn's videos for a while, trying to get her to continue rail the other things, not deliberately, but because something uh, she says makes me want to, uh, thinks that she will love it. I'll tell you what, I'm... I'll read, I'll read Mistborn Air 2. <laughs> And you I, I'm excited about life, sh- like life ship traders. Like that's the thing. I actually been wanting to read it for a long time. It's just <laughs> one of those things where it's like, it just keeps getting pushed off for whatever reason. Like you, do you have the book series like that? And <laughs> with Cheeto does. I would never read a book with Cheeto. I'm not a monster. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I do you like Cheetos? mostly clean food. Um, regular Cheetos. Yes. <laughs> I have gotten in the mood for a Cheeto now and then. 
but puff Cheetos are the nastiest things on the planet earth. <laughs> and I, I cannot Cheetos. understand how love- people know it's incorrect. <laughs> That's an incorrect take. <laughs> <laughs> so no puff, no puff for book no born. Puff. No, no puff. Uh, you asked if there's a if it, there's a series that I've been kicking down like the stairs. But you want to read it, you know? Yeah, Warlord Chronicles by Bernard yeah. Cornwell. I have been talking about reading that for like a year, and I and it's next. Like after uh, the Emperor's <laughs> Blades, and I do the Unhoned trilogy, it's next, folks. Like hold me to it. I'm starting it, and the then biggest, after that, Grace of Kings. The biggest problem is like, oh, Grace of Kings. Will you involve me in those chats? Yeah, I'll course. involve you in Malazan. You involve me in Grace All of right. Kings. All right. It's a um, I am. I'm really, I hate buying books that I don't read. I am not a mass buyer at all. Like I've never had like a physical TBR. Yikes. Since starting BookTube, <laughs> people are so kind and so amazing. And they send me books, which is like, I can't even believe people do that still. That like people buy books for me. But now I have like 14 books in my physical TBR. And the stress that gives me <laughs> is so overwhelming. So like, I don't own live ship traders. So that's why I'm not reading it. Like do you want me to send them to you? No, I don't. But like if someone if someone sent it to me, then I would be like, well, I have it. So like there's a reason to read it right now. But right now I just like I want to just never not have a book I own that I haven't read. So I'm this just is trying my to problem. get through the stuff I own. This is my problem with ebooks. I will get e I have ebooks that I, I'm excited about, but I'll read something I have physical first because it's mm. right there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like the stress of having that 14 book physical TBR is just like, I can't start anything up. I mean, the thing is Jake, yes, I would, but I don't want you to send it to me. I don't want you to, do you want to increase my stress? Do you want to increase my anxiety? No, you want to be a nice friend and not stress me out. <laughs> People getting excited about Warlord Chronicles. Yeah. It's, it's uh, Cornwell's Arthurian tell Arthurian. Yeah. That's how you say it. Um, but I am also going to continue Sun Eater. I know some people are waiting on that. But like my next trilogy, because this is the year of trilogies, by the way, for me. Because mm, okay, um, if you us, everything I've picked up seems to be a trilogy. Though um, the Dandelion Dynasty is not a trilogy anymore. It's a quartet. Not anymore. Right? It so. is. It is the quartet. Now that will be finished this year, right? Yeah, I have the fourth book in my possession currently. And that's that's a wrap, right? Like that's it. Yeah, it's it's an arc, so it's not coming out till June. Um, Ken Leo was super nice to send it to me and Kyle after, um, we did the interview with him. And so Kyle and I are going to read that next month. And I'm like pretty stoked. That's awesome. For it. it would, I will say though, like even, uh, Leo says this, like you pretty much are going to want to plan to read book three and four together. He yeah. literally just chopped the book in half. So it's like, it really should be read together. I'm totally cool with that. Uh, that's kind of how, um, dust of dreams and the crippled God is in Malazan, like the last two. Sorry. My kids are coming to say good night. Uh, this is uh, this adorable. Is, this is my son. <laughs> good night. Okay, good night. You don't want to probably come back in camera. <laughs> oh. <laughs> good night. Good night. That was the most adorable, <laughs> wholesome moment on chatting with Nuts history. <laughs> that was adorable. Um, Alicia says, are you continuing though with the Broken Earth trilogy? If you're talking to me, I actually already finished it. See, oh, let's talk about Broken Earth. I I, I finished uh, fifth season. I reviewed it. I never talked about it again on the channel. But yeah, I, I finished it. Um, I liked books two and three. I thought they were great. But I think book one is the most outstanding of the three and one of my favorite books ever. So this is a correct take. Um, book one is incredible <laughs> and uh, blew me away. Book two and three were only OK for me. Yeah, it, it was one of those things where like. I'm glad I read them and I'm glad I finished it. Yes. But like, I probably could have taken like a year between books instead of blitzing through it for myself. Though there were things I wanted answers to for sure. I think fifth season just by itself. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it's because I'm thinking about it a lot because I'm reading through all the Hugos and that every three of those books all run Hugos. Yeah. And I just think that's very interesting because I think the fifth season absolutely deserved it. I mean, wow, what a book. Yeah. Um, but I think it's interesting. Like if you thought of any series that all three of them won Hugo's, like that's not necessarily the series I would think about because yeah. I don't think it ended super strong for me. I thought it ended. I thought the ending was fitting. It didn't make me go, wow, that's the greatest ending I've ever read. Um, which yeah, are... I, it's, it's not, I guess it's not the ending as much. Like they were just questions I had about the magic system and things like that that did not come together for me. Yeah. And like, that's something that's important to me and isn't important to some readers well i think that that's a pretty interesting point to bring up is that do you 
and, and maybe it's not even a do you, but uh, everyone has things that at the end they need wrapped up. Mm -hmm. And and when we talk about even bigger series, right? Malazan is is this. Uh, Malazan, not every single string is tied up in Malazan. Some people get very upset by the things that are not tied up, and some people are okay with what's not tied up. I happen to fall kind of in the middle there. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely a, way more positive than than I would say the people who are usually disgruntled. But there are a couple strings that didn't get resolved for me that I was like, ah, man, I really latched onto that, and I didn't get the finish for that. Um, so it's interesting you say that because I didn't even really think about that for fifth season, about the world build and the magic and stuff. And now that you're saying that, I'm kind of starting to ask questions in my head like, maybe I did want some of that answer <laughs> like, <laughs> not, not, thinking not about to be a downer it. but yeah because i attached to that kind of stuff um and well so, it's fascinating and that and that's yes it. i mean it was i was really drawn into it but um yeah the fifth season another great uh representation of motherhood and its complications yes and um just the narrative that ends up getting weaved together um from our three main point uh characters was just really incredible in yeah. my opinion I agree. Um, I thought the writing was beautiful, very strong, opinionated narration like that. That is something I really enjoy. Um, it's actually uh, Anna Spark Smith, who is like people. She writes Grim Dark, and mm -hmm. I think it's called like the Court of Knives. I don't know. I don't know. I can't remember exactly. I actually have book one and I'm excited to read her because apparently she has a such a strong authorial voice. Like when she writes mm -hmm. that a lot of people think the writing's bad. But if you go outside of fantasy, um, like that's pretty normal. Oh like, yeah. <laughs> like, like honestly, King does that a lot too. Mm. Um, so it, it, it's interesting. Uh, I think that Jemison had that strong voice in that second person narration. I really and, loved it. and, um, she also just like, you know, um, something I noticed about the is, Yes. I was just going to say like, it probably is my Sanderson background, but it, <laughs> I mean, it depends what the book's giving me though, because I also, you know, I'm obsessed with Piranesi, which is the softest form of a world building magic you can imagine. There's no answers there, but that's what it's set up. So I just need you to answer to what you have set up. And Jemison did set up a certain amount of world building that ended up not being delivered for me by the hmm. end. Yeah. Um, Wanting that to come more into the grand stage of things rather than yeah. the Because I don't have to have hard magic systems. Like I am a huge Sanderson fan. I love the hard magic system, but it is not a required a core requirement for me in any way to like yeah. a book. Yeah. A a and also Adam mentioned uh, there are more Malazan books. Yes. I, <laughs> there's a ton of stuff that gets wrapped up in the extended universe mm. as well. I mean, I did read three and a half million words. I feel like I, you know, <laughs> you feel like you gave it a good call. Yeah, I get, I get, yeah, I get it a good call. <laughs> I'll read the extended stuff. Yeah. And people are saying it gets resolved and that's cool. But you know, there is some people who aren't going to do that and I can understand them being frustrated. You know, I do uh, feel like the main series has to stand on its own. Yes. And I do think Malazan series. does, by the way, just, yeah, just no, no. I, I do. I do think yeah. it does. Um, it's interesting though, because like as series get bigger and bigger and bigger, you, you almost expect every piece of the narrative to grow. And sometimes I feel like things slide away when series mm -hmm. get bigger and bigger. Um, Jemison and broken earth. I almost felt like she had so much potential. She should have kept going. Yes. Like it's almost a shame. It's not a seven book series in a lot of ways. Well, I think that was my problem with it. It was like, well, this is over, but you just, you didn't, you left so much, so much just on the table. Do you and think I she'd think, ever come back? I don't know. I, I mean, can, can I don't know if you can. Yeah. I think sometimes it's a bad idea, but I, I don't know. That was what was hard for me. And I, like you said, I, I read all three and I will stop a series at any point. So it wasn't like I disliked the series. It just, um, yeah, I think maybe what you said is right. I just need something more uh, yeah. at the end there with her. But yeah, the fifth season is so good. Yeah, it really is. And I and I did enjoy Broken Earth a lot, but uh, I, I think it's like head and shoulders. Like book one is head and shoulders, not just above book two and three, but of a lot of other books I read last year. Really loved yeah. it. Oh, what I was going to say about the Hugos is a lot of times the Hugo, um, they award for ideas, right? They're big on like, mm -hmm. especially um, ideas in the current consciousness, like... Um, Political is not the right word. I don't like to use that because I feel like it gets misused a lot as if they have an agenda. So I don't mean it in that way, but socially relevant. Yes, yeah, socially relevant issues. Yeah. And of all of the ones I have read that are clear that are they were nominated probably for these socially re relevant issues. I just think that Jemison does it the best because she takes a socially relevant issue, but makes it new. Yeah. Makes it interesting on its own. You wouldn't have to know about the social. <laughs> thing to make that a good or interesting book 
but then she also has the commentary on top of it. And I think a lot of the books I've read with some social commentary or about those things, they don't have the good book underneath it. So they have like the interesting ideas, but that's all it is. Does that that's, make sense? That's how I thought about and and not not socially relevant. Uh, but I kind of felt that way about Dune Messiah. Like Dune mm. Messiah had a lot of really cool ideas, and but it wasn't the greatest story. But the book didn't stand on its own. Yeah, I didn't feel like Dune Messiah was like a great book. Just had great things in it uh, and ideas behind it. So, and I love that you pinpointed that for Jemison because you're right. There's just a good book there, whether or not you li are living not. in this time or not. In a thousand years, well, I don't know about a thousand. But, you know, <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, a couple hundred years, it would still be a great story. Well, um, and, and it would have been a good story before we were talking about that issue too. Like yes. it, it would have just been a good story regardless. And and that's what makes it stronger in my opinion, actually, as a subtle commentary, which is kind of yeah. interesting Yeah, uh, in general. That's a really good way to pinpoint that, that why Broken Earth works. That's, Benjamin, that's... sorry. I got tired. Sorry, I read the comments. I just didn't mean to interrupt you. Finish no, your you're thought. Good. Uh, the Calculating Stars <laughs> read the coattails of a much superior hidden figures. Maybe? I just read the Calculating Stars. I cannot believe that one of Hugo. I'm extremely upset about it. I agree with you, Benjamin. It, I know nothing about this. I cannot wait to talk about the calculating stars. Um, yes, it completely rode the coattails of hidden figures. You are correct. Interesting. The end. I don't. I'm worried people really like it, so I don't want to get like too spicy about it. But uh, yeah, I I agree. Interesting. People were saying if you buy a Worldcom membership, you can vote at the Hugos um, for two. But years. I think you can only vote for the nominations. I don't think you can vote for who wins. And the only reason I feel that way is because so many extremely popular authors haven't won. And I feel like if it was fan voted, they would have won. So I yeah. think, I mean, I could Google it right now. Who votes for the Hugos? <laughs> Let's find out. We can find out together. While is you're this... Googling that, um, I really need your help on something. Uh oh, what? Uh, because I heard that we have a mutual interest. Mm -hmm. And that oh, mutual is interest is getting Alan to play D&D &D live on booktube. And it's, I, I, I want to be a part of this. I told been, him I'd be there. I've told I, him so many times. I keep telling him too. I said, it'll be the biggest thing on our little platform. Like without a doubt. You're right. It is just the members of Worldcon. And can you really pay to be a member of Worldcon? Who are the members of Worldcon? I'm sorry. I, we need to answer this question, right? Okay, I'll look at it later. Oh, I'll Alan, let you guys know. <laughs> Alan said, would you rules lawyer me? Um, I can neither confirm nor deny that I have ever rules lawyered anyone. Here's the thing. <laughs> I don't rules lawyer people. I don't rules lawyer people. But have I brought science or physics into it? Yes, because sometimes there are laws in our physical world that matter. For example, I played a D and D game on Nick's channel, um, which is, um, oh my gosh, why is his channel name just like totally fled? Um, <laughs> this is the whatever. Moment. Oh, I don't know, but um, <laughs> and we were falling, and I knew how high in the air we were. We were five hundred feet in the air, and he was like, "You can make one action," and I said, "Excuse you, nine point eight one meters per second is the falling." Like nine point, you fall 9.18 meters per second is falling velocity. So we, and six seconds is a round. And I calculated based on how high up we are in the air, I know how many rounds we have to fall. So yes, have I done that several times to my DM before? Yes. And I'm not going to apologize for it, but mostly I'm not a rules lawyer. <laughs> Nick says that D&D &D rules aren't based on physics. Says who? We live in a physical world. There are physics. The You're rule of me, course. Are you rules. telling me that the falling velocity is that different in favor? And I want you to give me the falling velocity if you really think terminal velocity is different in favor. You go, you go show me. You go show me that. Doesn't D&D &D state a falling rate? It actually states falling damage, which I believe is something like 66 per 10 feet. <laughs> I play a lot of D&D. &D. I know my stuff. I do not play a lot of D&D, &D, but I, I told Alan and and he said when I told him like that we should do this, he was like, Hillary's been on me about this as well. And I'm like, well, there we already have three people. I'm so excited because he wants to DM, which is amazing because he I would rather DM. play than DM. And he also claimed that Alan's... he would DM. What was it? What was it, Alan? He Alan's going to do it. Be... Well, he's been telling me that for a while. Oh. He like messaged me and be like, we're going to do it. And he won't give me a date. So don't, don't listen to Alan. I'm telling you, it will, it would be the most popular thing anyone's done. 
in our little niche. I'm we telling you. We would do you. a one shot. One shot. You know. Um, would, would you do book, book characters or would you make your own character? I prefer to make my own characters. All right, that's fair. Yeah, I mean, we could if people were really into doing book characters. I think Alan said we were going to do it in like the basement of a Costco or something. I can't remember. <laughs> like that's what he said on the live. I think I can't remember what live we were doing when he said that. It was like, <laughs> Alan, I'll do my own character, and his name will be Narsa. Um, and I will say witness a lot. Oh, wicked good books. Sorry, Nick's channel is wicked good books. I just want to make sure I say that because I felt really bad that yeah, I didn't that, get that out there. Yeah, he's going to be mad. He gonna was going to be mad. Be um. <laughs> Oh, Home Depot. It was a Home Depot. You're right. It was it was the Home Depot. Um, yeah, I think own characters are fun. Um, you haven't played much D and D, Jimmy? No, I played a, a one shot at work that was, eh. Uh, and then we tried to do it with friends. Had a really good time, but we never continued. And it's always mm. been that same starting D and D adventure with a goblin on the card. Oh. And, mm. and I've always just wanted to do like more of a homebrew. And that like talking to Erickson and hearing him talk about how him and um, Esselmont gamed out Malazan. It makes me want to play so much because the creativity so fun. and the storytelling and the character development that you can get from that while also bonding with people. I mean, that's yeah. um, I actually want to talk to people about like D and D is how we made some of our adult friends because yeah. it's like the, I mean, we've had, um, we have two campaigns going right now, but one of the campaigns we started about six years ago and they were our friends, but they were like more, some of them were just kind of like random acquaintances we knew. Mm -hmm. They are our closest friends. They are like literally like our, our close friends because it was something, how often in your adult life do you have that much planned get together with people? No, never. Right? We were doing it every other Thursday. In fact, we still do it every other Thursday. It's been six years. Every other Thursday for like three hours. Yes. And the way you get to know people through playing this like role playing is just like crazy. And um, it's just so fun. Like, and we did um, when we were living in California and before this whole, you know, pandemic, we yeah. did one shots um, with just people we knew. We said, hey, come try D&D out. We'll host a bunch of one shots at our house. And so we did that. Out of all the ones we did, I think we did like six. Um, only one person didn't want to do it again. Like everyone was like, please, can we do this again? Like it is like it is so fun to do. I, I I'm so envious of a good in person D and D or even a good virtual. <laughs> well, we've been virtual now ever since the pandemic because then we all moved away and it's just there's nothing like being in person. And actually, here's my sob story: two months, so Christmas before pandemic, mm. I we bought so much fancy D and D stuff. We bought <laughs> like all this table stuff. We this back here is a DM board I had custom made for us. Um, I don't know. You can I want to play D and D. And then now we've been virtual for the last two years. I just, I need in-person friends to play D&D with again. But I'm, fl I'm flying out. Person. I'll fly out. Fly out. We'll play. <laughs> yes, do it. Um, what's my favorite D&D module? Um, our groups have just done like a ton of mixtures of modules in homebrew. So I can't necessarily say we've ever played like a full module all the way through. We tend to, as DMs, we tend to just like start going way off story by the end. Yeah. Um, but I will say we really enjoyed Curse of Strahd. Um, that was a really fun module that I liked a lot. I feel like there's just a whole like rabbit hole that I want to go down so bad. Alan, I'm just, I'm talking a big game. I'm good with DMs. You can trust me. I won't be me. Yeah, Alan, um, <laughs> please do this. Like I need a real D&D &D experience and it would be a lot of fun. And I'm just going to be a, a complete mess. Like I, I, I look forward to stepping out of my personality traits and creating a character mm -hmm. that is nothing like me. I think that would and, be a lot. And of what's fun. funny is like your first D&D character a lot of times is you think you're making a different character, but it's just you. And like <laughs> in our first group, like it's just you, like you tried, but it's just you. And it's funny as like, I've been playing for years now. Like I actually get to have fun being drastically different people. Yeah. It's, it's fun. I think uh, I'll probably just end up being a meathead like I am in real life and it'll be it'll just be what it is like and I'm okay with that you know well what's funny is like um I'm someone who likes to solve puzzles like I like you know that's the stuff like I personally like so a lot of my characters tend to be those characters and in one of our modules I'm like no I'm not doing it like I my lowest stat is intelligence and wisdom I'm not allowed to solve things and it was so hard at first because like 
I'm I'm playing a stupid, strong character. They must be a stupid and strong. Um, but it's been the most fun experience, though, forcing myself to play somebody different. I, I imagine that that goes a long way in writing characters, because for me, mm. whenever I've tried writing and, and the stuff that I've written, it's always a little bit tough for me to get out of my own skull and get into another character's skull. And like, I think every character has like a little piece of you. At least that's how I am. Um, but I, I do think D&D would would flex that muscle. Absolutely. You know? I mean, Zach was saying like him running. Um, Zach was our first DM in this main group I was talking about. Um, and he said finishing that D, uh, that campaign with us was one of the big motivators for him to like write his book. That's because awesome. crafting a story was so fun as a DM. Yeah. Um, that he was like, okay, I want to like actually like try to write something and make a story like I did for, for our campaign. Yeah. That's awesome. I, yeah. And I think, uh, for me, like there's ideas that I'd like to try out like in a D and D like campaign. Oh, absolutely. Fun. Yeah. Alan said I had some of the most coolest and emotional role playing moments with characters and NPCs. So much freaking fun. Well, Alan, we look forward to uh book tube D and D we're waiting it's not Wait. us it's you alan you i got all the time <laughs> i will quit my job tomorrow not really we'll, we'll burn our houses down we'll leave it all behind i will move <laughs> to florida don't i will not move to florida yeah i mean uh, absolutely not nah. but <laughs> Hell, never uh, <laughs> i'm kidding all my floridians i'm just kidding so alan doesn't sell it very well he says there's like needles on the beach so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Alan's like the first person to tell you not to move to Florida. I like my rain too much. I'm literally going to grab my book. Let's go out. We'll start first okay. session. Let's do character build right now. <laughs> Let's, <laughs> Let's just do it. No, I got to think too much about this. Yeah. I think about it. I have to carefully consider. Uh, well, we've done about three hours. How do you feel? I mean, this, this has been wonderful. I'm feeling, I'm feeling great still. I thought I'm supposed to break Alan's record to make oh, him mad. Oh, we can break Alan's record. I can't break Alan's record. I doubt it. Because what I still got an hour and a half until that. Like, I'm still going strong. But am I going strong enough for an hour and a half? I don't know. You know, are you still enjoying yourself enough for another hour and a half? I am I am enjoying myself <laughs> quite a bit. Um, I looked up. I <laughs> Alan's screaming. No. <laughs> <laughs> the millionaire says yes <laughs> the, the ever war of wanting to hold these records alan i have the power right now to break your record so is that going to motivate you to like bribe me by being like we'll set a date for this D, &D campaign Ooh. you know Ooh, i love it you i'm open to that particular bribe <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is kind of a cool question. Uh, Brian says, do you guys think D&D and VR will become mm. a thing? Now that is interesting. That could be really cool. I will say, oh, this is the old person in me talking. There is something fundamental about D&D getting together and using imaginations. Like yeah. that's, that's the thing. You get together and it's purely imaginary. Like we weren't using maps when we were together or anything um, pre-pandemic. Um, and really about connecting with people. And so once you do that VR element, it's just like further removed from people. So to me, there would be a big fundamental part of Dungeons and Dragons that didn't feel that way anymore. It would feel more like a video game. However, I still think it would be awesome. I just think it would be different. I think it would be neat if, so for instance, like if if I'm here and you're there and in the VR helmet, I, I'm with you in a room. Like yeah. think of it that way, like, like you have your, uh, you know your dm uh board and everything in the vr experience so it's not even like the atmosphere and stuff it's oh i see i see mm, interesting. Yeah. That, that could be cool now that is a great and honestly it's it's interesting that like because i agree with you i think it takes away from some of the imagination but it could just put you in the same area as the person and you're sitting at a dinner table you know a generic dinner table and and you're playing dnd &D. that could be pretty cool that's pretty cool but i will say because the other thing I was thinking where it was like the actual rooms or something, all I can think is like, oh, that's even more work for a DM. Like, do well, you know yeah, what I mean? No. Like, it would have, it <laughs> DMs are like, so uh, like a, what's that one? Roblox or whatever, where you build your own games. Like, you would have to have something like that to build modules. That was like a sandbox. Yeah, um, it would still be just so much work. Like, as someone who's DM'd, like, you feel like it's a second job sometimes. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> to, I couldn't even imagine. That. Um, anyway, that could be I fun. Know. I enjoy gaming aspects probably more than role playing stuff. Mm. Maps and stuff. I do love maps. I'm a big actually. Sometimes I get books bonus points for good maps. I'm not gonna lie to you. Like it has it has a uh, 
impact on my enjoyment overall, especially if I'm really into the book. Uh, I'll pull out the map and do start like, you, people. Do you, do you have like a vivid picture in your head when you read a book? Nope. Oh, okay. Not visual at all. Because I'm you? not, no, I'm not at all, but that's also why I don't care about maps. <laughs> I'm just like, I don't care where we are. <laughs> like, whatever. <laughs> so for me, it, it, it adds like a level of immersion that I don't get mm. in my head. Um, and this is something that. I've talked about with manga is like manga. It, I don't have to imagine anything. It's mm. right there. And sometimes that's tough because Berserk has some of the most foul things I've ever seen in my life. And I'm like, man, I kind of wish I didn't have to see. This. <laughs> I didn't, it's like, I, didn't have to wish I could it just out. read it and then blank it out in my brain. You know? <laughs> um, oh, the Emperor's Blade. It does have a good map. It does have a good well, map. Well, what you tell me, because I'm um, indifferent pretty much to a map. Uh, yeah. What makes a good map? Uh, I love varying regions. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I also enjoy ridiculous waterways. Uh, I know that okay. sounds like in huge obstacles. Um, the, the basic example would be the wall from A Song of Ice and Fire. It is like a monumental piece of the land. It plays a role, not just... In the story, but also geography wise, oh, they can't come low because of this. The neck in, in A Song of Ice and Fire takes a big role. So it's almost more like how it's used in the book. And then I, I can like go in the map actually backs up the geography that you're seeing in the book. Pretty big on that. Uh, Erickson's maps are insanely detailed because mm. he is an archaeologist and he takes that stuff super serious like even like water collection in the city he has it all like mapped out he's crazy i do uh, have is that in the first malazan book i want to go look at what you think is a good map is there a good map uh, in the yeah book? there That's should the only one be. i own yeah okay, there i'll should go look be. at it after yeah um one of my favorite maps actually is the banished lands from john gwen i really oh, okay. really like it and i don't necessarily even think that it's like that inventive but it has like an open plane like oh there's the planes it's all stuff ostenard has a great map for memory song thorn i actually made a i made a, a youtube Wait, video about maps <laughs> about about the lands of ostenard and i go through the map and i talk about the different regions and the in the languages they speak in the regions because tad's very big on languages um really cool really really cool um, but I don't know if necessarily like a map. I mean, I look at a map and go, oh, that's a sick map. Uh, but like when I really get into it is whenever the story actually has pieces that play that. contributes with the map. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. That's I mean, I've looked at a map occasionally if like we're doing a lot of traveling and I need some sort of concept of like where things are, but otherwise I don't, um, I don't tend to look at the map like, cause I'm boring. I don't have a visual in my head and I just don't care about having a visual in my head. Yeah. I generally yeah. don't. Um, especially on rereads like a song of ice and fire i did the map plotting like where characters are and you mm. realize that people who need to meet are like so close and you're like oh. ah oh that's like it adds so much. <laughs> it, it adds to like the drama you're like you're so close aria why didn't you just go next door like damn you um and it adds a little bit more heartbreak so that's always good um, yeah the um gosh the whole trope of like not having instant communication and people being so close and then missing is one of the most frustrating but realistic things in fantasy novels but yeah. like growing up now where we have so much instant communication it is like so painful sometimes to read <laughs> i mean do you remember calling people on their house phone and like or like yes. you're trying to get a hold of someone and you don't get home for days and that was normal that was normal. You do that now. I'm calling out a warrant. <laughs> yeah, just like, like, I mean, I mean, sometimes like I have told people like when they get mad, I have a response. I'm like, I just don't want to be next to my phone. Sometimes I don't, yeah. I should not be able to be contacted at all times. I like, I don't want to be, uh, but yeah, I mean, yeah, before even just like, well, my mom was on the phone, so you couldn't get to me because we have one line, like, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like if you go away from your phone for four hours and you come back, like you have to explain to the person why you didn't respond. Like, Oh, sorry. No. I, I was doing this instead of just responding. No, that's absolutely true. You have to apologize. Mostly just to my <laughs> mom. Amazing. My mom was on, she needs to know where I am at all times. <laughs> that That's a very motherly thing to do. Um, I remember my friend, uh, he, he went away for the week. I didn't know. And he went like kayaking or something. He was out somewhere. He didn't have service. I thought he died. Oh my gosh. You were just I, like, literally, I, I literally, I literally started. Yeah, I started going through like the grief process. Like I was like, "Oh my god, I, I've lost my best friend, and no one knows where he is." He just he just went on a little trip, little weekend trip. <laughs> I know it's. I was distraught. Uh, I mean, you do though. Like I would even do it sometimes. Like not anymore again because Zach works from home now. But like he'd be at work, and like I text him, and it'd be like six hours, and I'd be like, "He died on the way to work." Like 
a bus got hit. I'm like Googling, you know? And so he turned on read receipts for me because he's like, sometimes I'm just like really too in a meeting to respond. But then if I know he's read it, then I feel fine. Cause it's like, you're alive. Yeah. You were alive enough to pick up your phone and read (laughs) and read the message. (laughs) But can you imagine like even because we were we found out we were both born in the same year. Just even imagine like a couple decades earlier than that. You really might not see people for like weeks, months, hear from them. You just don't even know. Yeah. No. Remember summer break? (laughs) That was a break. (laughs) You came back and people people grew. People changed. People had dyed hair. You didn't know what was going to happen with any of them. You had like the two friends who lived on your street. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Somebody. And, you know, I remember I lost a ton of weight uh, one year in high school and I came back three months later. I was a new man. Everyone's like, mm. who's this? I'm like, oh, it's just me. And they're like, whoa, you lost a person I'm like I did. <laughs> no, I, I did that. I did that one year. It's great. And, 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 and <laughs> you know, you got to be able to miss people a little bit. <laughs> you got to be able to take a step back. Let me miss you. It's very important. I agree. I oh, agree. my goodness. Alan says, I'm going to hit you guys up in a direct message making plans. Let's see. Let's see. I have my phone on do not disturb. So I don't Alan, know. I mean, know. I don't, I never, uh, first of all, I never have notifications. So I guess if you're wondering, if you message me on Instagram, I don't respond. Yeah, I never have notifications, but um, I don't have a message, Alan. So liar. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, no, I don't turn note. So I have no notifications on for anything other than text messages because I don't want any social media to ever bother me and tell me what's happening. That's amazing. Maybe, I, maybe I should uh, take that. <laughs> he says I have. <laughs> oh man. Um, yeah. I don't want to know. So also like, yeah, I'm just, yeah, I don't have a good reads. I'm difficult to contact. Sometimes I, like I don't it. check my book, my book email. Sometimes I don't check for like two weeks and then I get on like, I'm bad at this. I don't know what to tell people. Yeah, I'm pre- I'm pretty uh, there for the people that are in my patron discord. And then outside of that, I don't check social. I'm media there for Instagram much. for the most part. Like I'm there during the yeah. day, but like I don't get notifications. I just um, I don't know if you just Jimmy, if you just get overwhelmed sometimes, like sometimes I'm just like overwhelmed by like yes. responding to things and I just need a break. Yeah, no, uh, I totally understand it. And this week specifically um i think it's because like work's been a little bit crazy for me lately too but um i've had some times where like i keep trying to open up my book and read and it's like i'm like i'm like okay all right all right i'll just answer this one and then you answer it and then somebody else messages you and it's like do you all like get together and are like james gonna read at eight let's mess him up like i just want to read you know and it's tough because I, a lot of times i i would even read on my phone like through kindle app i, I do that right, now. Right. um or i listen i do a lot of immersion reading so i listen to audiobook as i read and so I, I have my phone and then it's like oh let me just check my email real quick and then i open up my email i'm like ah oh, god but like the number one way of reading more people always say like how do you read so much it's just literally turn your phone off like it's it's the quickest way to increase your reading if you really want to yeah and it's um I tried really hard to like, I'm not good at it, but I've tried like, Mm. there's times where you just get on the internet, like on your computer, and then an hour goes by and you have not accomplished anything. And for me, it's like, I want my hobbies to feel accomplished. Now, this doesn't mean like, because some people are like so rude about copies like video games. But when I play a video game, I feel like I accomplished something. Like I enjoy my time and it felt like I used it wisely. And I feel the same way when I'm reading, but surfing the internet almost never gives me that feeling. And um, yeah. I'm trying really hard to like, whenever I have that inclination, like do something else, pick up a book, like, like play a video game. If I'm feeling lazy or even just like watch a show. Cause like sometimes I don't even want to sit down and watch TV, but then I yeah. waste an hour doing nothing. And like, would have just been more productive to watch an episode of something. Yeah. This you is know? actually a, a thing. It's called time anxiety. And I went through it very hard during the beginning of the pandemic where I had a lot more extra time because I couldn't go to jujitsu mm-hmm. and I was lifting here at home. Um, and it's, it's the, analyzation of like kind of like your time and what you're spending it on. And like, I couldn't watch more than an hour of TV. Cause I'm like, Oh, I can't watch two hours of TV. I got to like do something else, but I wouldn't do anything. Yes. And We've I would just, there. I would just sit there and be like, I guess I just won't do anything just so I, I have time to do anything, but I'm not going to do it. It's it, yeah. It's called time anxiety. It's a real thing. Um, and oh, I struggled yeah. with it a lot and it took a while for me to get over it, but I, ha- I had to tell myself like, it's okay to read a book for eight hours if you want to, or if you want to watch TV, watch TV for six hours. Like as long as you're okay with the time 
and you get something out of it, there's really no harm in it. Yeah. And, and that's another point. Cause I have had to tell myself sometimes like, it's okay to not be productive every hour of the day. That's something I struggle yes. with. Like yes. this idea that every hour has to be productive. And it's like, well, maybe tonight I needed to be absolutely unproductive and read whatever crappy thing I'm reading, uh, on the internet because I was enjoying that. And I was sitting and like, do I have to be working all the time yeah. towards something? And this is like, that's like a hard thing too to get, get over that. It's a, uh, especially in coding, like whenever I was learning how to code every single day, I'd come home from my nine to five, I would come home and I would code. I would learn because I was trying to get a job. Yeah. And then like all of a sudden I have the job and I don't have to code my free time, but then I felt bad for not coding in my free. And it was like this weird thing. And now I, I know the balance of when I want to work on something on the side. Um, in a lot of ways, booktube is my side thing now. So, yeah. um, and booktube has replaced that for me where some of them like, well, I could be working on booktube. Like if I just worked on it every second, I could do this more stuff. And I, and, and I have to be like, well, just, it's okay sometimes to not be working on something Yeah. in general. Yeah. Sometimes it's okay to take a breath. And, uh, you know, I love, and some people give me crap for it, but I love sitting down and reading like all day. Like it's, it's something I do and I, and I enjoy it and I don't have kids. So if that I helps. could do it, that sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. I would do it. I used to do it. I used to do it all the time as a teenager. Yeah. I went through a bad breakup one time. I literally went to the library and like stayed in bed for like two weeks reading. Oh. Like that's all I did for one summer. I just like stayed in bed and read. I look back on it very fondly. Yeah. To be honest. Sometimes I was 17. Was... Yeah. Things were <laughs> simpler times. then. Things were a things lot simpler. Were, things were simpler. Uh, uh, yeah well i think i am going to get some dinner because i was dumb and i didn't eat I, you before know this. i didn't eat before this either and i, I am kind of hungry so that's a very good point <laughs> <laughs> and plus alan did agree to dm so we don't have to break so his we record don't, we don't have to break his record no uh, but We've but i would enough. i would really love to have you back on uh because this was Jeez. effortless <laughs> i would love that mall is on grace of kings yes absolutely more chatting with nuts maybe i could talk to zach i mean there, there's a lot oh, of yeah. uh there's a lot of things that we can do here um but it's always been a pleasure to collaborate with you um i didn't really know too much about you until we did our first collaboration where we talked about best serve cold like i knew of you and watched your videos uh and you reached out to me um so one i appreciate that and two uh it was like immediate i felt like we had really good conversation and that best serve live cold best served wait best, best serve cold, cold live, live. <laughs> Best of live colds. Um, that was one of my most fun lives because I mean, I, I had never met Leanna before that either. I reached out to all of you guys cold. I knew, I knew Jake a little bit, um, but I reached out to all of you guys cold and that was, we were all vibing. That was, yeah, we, that was a vibe. Yeah. I got after Jake and told him he wrote a uh, red Terry good kind, but didn't finish the book. And, <laughs> yeah. Well, and um, I still haven't read the heroes. I really want to, but I actually want to repeat that live with all of us again. Uh, I'm you guys in. will come on once and do it for the heroes and then do it, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm sure there'll be some we agree on instead of like that life. But um, yeah, I think that would be really fun to do again because it was that was a fun life. Yeah, I've always I've always enjoyed collaborating with you since that time. And uh, I look forward to doing some more stuff. And I'm glad that I finally got you on on my channel. Yeah. So. And I'm and I've been asking you to do a grimdark one for a while. I want to do yes. a video on grimdark. We just been busy. You know, it's hard sometimes to do yeah. the lives um, with kids. Yeah. Um, but so we're going to do that. You guys can look forward to that. Eventually me and Jimmy are going to talk about grim dark just yes, in general as a, and it's awesome because genre. me being a nihilist and you being an optimist, I think that it, it's fascinating that we both can find some common ground in, in that. So me too. Um, so that will be fun. Oh, yeah. Jake wants to actually be positive uh, about the heroes. So yes, Jake, <laughs> we'll definitely have you back on so that you can gush about it. <laughs> yes. Star says, thank you both for doing Well, thank you. Thanks for uh, coming and watching. Yes. Um, you know, I, I, I think to Bookborn, but I also always think to chat because you are the third guest here at Chatting with Nuts. And uh, this is a pleasure. I mean, it's, it's been it's always two weeks between the episodes. Um, but for some reason, it felt like a really long like I was dying to talk uh, to everyone tonight. That was like something I've been looking forward to. And it kind of got me through a, a kind of a crappy week. So uh, I appreciate you all in the chat. And of course, Bookborn, I appreciate you as well. Thank you for inviting me. I feel so special. Uh, you yeah. finally got me on. I was like, <laughs> I'm cool enough that Jimmy invited me to chat with nuts. You're always welcome <laughs> here on the channel for sure. Um, the next episode, folks, will be in three weeks. Uh, in two weeks, I actually will not be here. I'm going on a little vacation. So I'll be back in three weeks. Uh, and 
as always, I appreciate you guys so much. Go check out Bookborn's channel. I have it linked down in the description. I think most people are probably already subscribed to you, um, but please do so if you are not. Some amazing content there. I'm looking forward to more adaptation, investigation. Yeah, I'm do it this year. Well, it's going to be awesome. Be All right, everyone. Well, until I see you next time, be good, be safe, and remember to always keep turning the page. <laughs>